Okay, folks, um, can I call the meeting to order? Um, we have full attendance. There are no apologies. Um, the Chair, Deputy Chair and Orlea are joining the meeting remotely. Um, so, may I remind the members about the protocols regarding use of electronic devices? Uh, there's no chairperson's business, and the minister is ready and waiting to go. So I suggest we defer uh, any other business until after we speak to the minister. Is that fair enough? Yep. yep. Minister, you you're ready to go. I am chair. Congratulations on your appointment. <laughs> Hopefully, it's only going to be a short one. Uh, so, if you want to go ahead, Robin, with your briefing. Feel free. Uh, pad, pad, I had presented um, uh, last week myself and, and the chief medical officer only due to dial in. It's only me today. Uh, what it offered them we had? Because I didn't say to those who are joining us remotely that the chief medical officer won't be joining you for this briefing. Uh, he was unable to make it this morning. Thank you. last time and by the time I got around a number of questions uh, there was a number of members who hadn't had the opportunity to ask questions so as I said we'd come back back again this week to pick up but I suppose as we all know this is a very fast fast moving moving time that we're in within the health service so just to give you a brief update um, as to where where we are and where we've moved in the last the last couple of days. Um, members will be aware that we've released last night uh, the next step in our, I suppose, our surge plan. And that's the identification of what is our equivalent to the Nightingale hospitals. And and you'll see in that we're, we're using the Belfast City um, tar block, which will be our, I suppose, regional intensification unit. And that'll be, we're working on that now to get that up to 230 beds. So that anybody that needs uh, intensive care at this stage, we will be able to pull them into a central facility. Um, but, and it, it is, it, this is temporary work why, why we get through COVID and work through, through where we're at at this minute in time. So we can actually get them into the same space and give them the support and care that they're needed. Um, that was, I suppose that was that's, that's today's announcement. Yesterday's announcement, you'll be aware um, we presented the results, or, or the results of our first um, Northern Ireland specific uh, modelling, and that's that. I suppose is, is our first pass on on the data that we have uh, as to what we can expect. Um, at this moment in time, that modelling is showing our peak head in Northern Ireland somewhere between the sixth and the twentieth of April. So you know we're, we're getting close into that that time frame. Or reasonable worst case scenario, and that's assuming um, that we you know we have 66 percent observing social distancing, and 70 percent of those who are sim symptomatic but not not critical self isolating. Our reasonable worst case scenario shows that at peak um, we will need 180 critical care beds. Uh, to put that into perspective, that means at any one time. Uh, in that period, that two-week period, there'll be 181 patients. Now, they're not there for the entirety of that time, but our peak demand will be 180 on, a, on, on the worst day, the recent worst-case day. Uh, the peak number, then, of COVID-19 patients who are requiring oxygen, and again, that's, I suppose, one thing we always need to be clear in regards to, to those who need intensive care and ventilation and those who need oxygen support. Uh, we're looking at 400 um, 400 per day as well. So that, that's the facilities that we're, we're really gearing up so that we can provide that that detailed support for our COVID-19 patients. Um, and that's, I suppose, an explanation why we've been rumping back and scaling down on some of our core service and the elective work um, over the past number of weeks so we can get ready in preparation for that. Um, the peak number during that during that same period, the peak number of hospital admissions we're expecting is 500 a week. Now that's people who need hospital medical attention due to COVID, maybe not and not oxygenated or an ICU. So there's 500 there coming in a week as well. 
And I suppose the one that really focuses people's mind is the the number of deaths over that uh, the twenty week period of the epidemic that we're already we're already in, and that's been that's been estimated around three thousand. Now I have stressed, and when we released this figure, the, these figures yesterday, this is our reasonable worst case scenario planning because you know we've been able to see some of the behaviours that have been recommended and have been pushed by members being adopted. So from from the initial estimations of you know of that thirteen fourteen thousand, which was if we'd done nothing, ignored all the guidance, um, you know it really shows even through this this initial modelling that the responsibility and the responsible acts that people take can actually have um, have on or, or, or the number of, of deaths we can expect in Northern Ireland. But it also shows that in the reasonable worst case scenario of those 180 people that will need critical care beds and ventilation, every every step now that reduces the number of people reaching that, that peak worst case scenario actually has a big has a big has a big sphere of influence. Um, a number of other things that I suppose since, since we since we last spoke and, and last met, we have issued now um, the letters to the, the vulnerable um, as was, and those who were asking to stay at home. So those, those have been issued to upwards on, on 40,000. Now we're still doing a further trawl. Um, GPs did the initial trawl and we're getting through those. Um, but the Health and Social Care Board are doing another trawl through central records to make sure that no one has been missed or, or overlooked at that. So that work that work is even intensifying and we're going down into, I suppose, a, a, a more detailed uh, number of, of people. Um, there's a number of key conditions that have been highlighted and are consistent across across the United Kingdom who have been asked to self-isolate for that period of time. Um, a further point then will be your memorandum of understanding um, with with the Irish government, and that's going to be signed um, signed shortly uh, between our two two chief medical officers. Now, uh, I suppose it's a high level document that that reinforces the principles and commitments um, that we already are doing. So it's the in regards to the commitments, this is sharing and modelling uh, public health and non pharmaceutical measures, common public messages, you know those behavioural changes changes that that we see. Um, research, um, uh, ethics, and, and just general engagement and, and governance. So as it's putting on a more formal basis uh, the things that we have been doing because we have a very good, strong working relationship with the Health Service in the Irish Republic through our Chief Medical Officers, through my engagement with the Minister down there. So with good good, good working relationships north and south and east-west as well. So it's it's important that we get, we get the benefit out of as much as we can. Um, in regards to to testing, and I know that's that's that, that that's the challenging piece as well. We are pushing on um, extensively with with our testing capabilities. Uh, we're doing that now in partnership with um, a number of labs across government, the state, and I suppose universities as well. But we're also tying into the the commercial provision that has has been sourced um, centrally with the United Kingdom, which includes uh, actually includes Ramdox. As as a part of of that United Kingdom basis, so so the members will I suppose members will have seen uh, there's no big secret you no know, the MOT site and a site of the Odyssey um, as being developed. Um, we are looking you know we're putting preparations in place um, so that we, when we come to the next uh, the next line of testing that we do have have facilities there. But while we have our testing capability, we still remain focused on the. On that, you know, on, on the definitions of where we test first, and the, te- the first le- line of testing is for those who are admitted to hospital who have either COVID symptoms or uh, appear to be, so that we can make sure they're given the right treatment. The second line is then of those who are in, um, I suppose, secure or or cohorted accommodation. So that should that be residential homes, old people's homes, or those facilities for those people with special educational needs. And the third line, of course, is our our health our healthcare workers, um, and I think that's a, that is a very important group. Uh, and I, just to, I, I suppose we had a very good meeting yesterday with um, the RCM, myself, the Deputy First Minister, and the First Minister. I spoke earlier that morning with with Unison as well. So we're we're setting up a new cell where we 
we make sure our unions are fully involved and fully plugged in as to the changes that are being made. I suppose just to give members an update on Monday, uh, Monday of this week, out of the tests, we did complete 387 of those were for for healthcare workers. Um, so that, that focus is working on. So as we increase our testing capability, um, we'll be able to expand not only the healthcare workers that we test, but also into other key sectors sectors as well. So I, I think, Chair, that's that's the main issue. Uh, sorry, PPE. PPE was the other one. Um, and again, uh, in regards to the concerns of PPE, we have we have supplies out through the system. Uh, I think we're still seeing challenges to make sure the right PPE gets to the right people at the right time. And that is a job of work that we're pushing down to make sure that what is needed is what is available. Um, in regards to the guidance on as to what PPE is necessary in certain situations, um, that has been a concern. That has been been expressed by our health and social care workers, and it's one that we're well well aware of because it's something that you know I, I'm I'm especially passionate about to make sure that those who need the appropriate PPE are getting it. So there has been a, a, what has been designated a rapid review of uh, current guidance, and that's been commissioned across as, as across the United Kingdom, but and has included the chief medical officers and the chief nursing officer and also the Secretary General of the RCM, uh, Dame Donna Kinnear, has been been involved with that. So so that will make further recommendations to your current guidance as to what PPE should be worn in certain circumstances. So that may, ref- well, it probably will come about in the change of, of, of what PPE is, is, is worn and provided for certain areas because we have to make sure that those people who are carrying out the, the rules at this moment in time within our health service are protected and supported to, to the utmost that we can. So, Chair, that's, that's just a very brief update as to, uh, I suppose, where we've been from, from this time last week. So I'm happy enough to, to take questions. If there's anything I can't answer in, in the absence of the Chief Medical Officer, we'll, we'll, we'll get that back to you. Okay, Minister, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm going to kick off with a few questions and then I'm going to invite the the Chair and the Vice Chair to come in remotely. Uh, And after that, we'll go to Paula, who didn't get asking questions last week. So, just uh, first of all, Minister, there were reports from the British government yesterday that they distributed uh, 400 million items of, of PPE within the last fortnight. How much of that did we get? We haven't received any of that uh, as of yet, but we are on that supply chain, so that is all on the way to you. Um, I spoke with Connor and I had a meeting yesterday, so there's been there's been a communication put in, and I suppose in regards to PPE, where we're looking for our supply our supply chains is, is what's available from the United Kingdom, uh, also in the partnership with the Republic of Ireland, and um, it's that piece of work um, the Connor and I, the two departments, are working together to make sure we're plugged into that order that's coming across from China. Excuse me, from from China as well. But also the third part, um, and it's mostly Connor's department will be taking the lead in that, is what we can produce, produce on and manufacture here locally. So the likes of nails or blog blinds is where we can actually tap into to your own, own local manufacturers. So, so nothing in, in response to you, nothing has touched down as of yet, but it's on its way. The order was put in and there that order's being processed now. Right. So so just to be clear then, out of four hundred million items that were distributed in the last two weeks by the British government, we, we haven't received one single item. But what I'm saying is no, it's, it's in the process of coming here. We still have our own stocks and supplies. And what I wouldn't want to do here is get into any sort of political discussion about who has supplied or, or who hasn't supplied the orders. And Connor's aware of what I was working with, and we're talking about that. And, and it's, it's on its way. It's, it's not that it's not that it's been denied to us, or it's not that we haven't got it. It is not as I said in the distribution chain. You know, I was listening to uh, Pat Cullen on the radio this morning, and she was complaining that. Uh, nurses in acute hospitals and community uh, nurses are still experiencing shortages of PPE. So, uh, if the British government are distributing 400 million items and we aren't getting any, then there's a problem there somewhere. Pat, and that's what I was saying earlier on when we had the conversation. 
conversation with with Pat yesterday. You know, we're, we're aware of there are, and, and this isn't the fact that it's, the PPE isn't arriving from the UK. It's the fact that we still have challenges within our own supply chain here as to how we get the appropriate PPE out to those who need it at the point of time they actually need it. So that's the challenge we have here. We have, we have currently no physical shortage in, in our current stockpile, and we're pushing that out through the trust, through through the, the care sector as well, to make sure that that PPE is there for the people who need it at this moment in time. So we are we are receiving reports of individual wards on on nurses and doctors not having the correct PPE, but as the reassurance is there, the PPE is in the chain. It's just our challenge is actually making sure the trust get it to those people who need it on time. Well, if, if, if there's no shortages in the supply line here, then you, you should take that up with Pat Cullen and the RCN. But in any event, I'm sure others will want to come in on, on the issue of PP, PPE. The conversation we actually had, we had a good conversation with Pat yesterday in, in regards to PPE. So, you know, we're fully aware of this. It's, it's a job of work we're actually working well with the unions on the RCN as well, because you know, we made it clear when I, when I was talking to Pat yesterday. Um, if she had any specific issues, we're open for the, the, those conversations. And look, we've a good communication to the with them. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I want to move on to the issue of testing. Uh, and I mean, it's been clear over the last three months, um, from early January anyway, that the guidance from the, the World Health Organization, more recently from the ECDC, uh, was the test, test, test and the test, trace, uh, and isolate. And the date that hasn't been happening here, now I note yesterday, Michael Gove uh, says uh, there's a need to go further and faster. And Boris Johnston also said yesterday that uh, testing will unlock the puzzle of the crisis. Uh, where, where do you stand in all of this, uh, Robin, in terms of testing? Because uh, I mean, I'm sure you would agree that testing has not been a priority to date. Um, uh, no, I would, I would actually disagree that, that testing hasn't been a priority. We've been pushing to, to try and get our testing, testing capabilities up as hard and, and as fast as we can locally here, Pat. Now, we always have to remember that, um, you know, from a disease that was initially identified in December uh, to where we are now in our testing capability. Uh, we, we've, we've pushed it. We haven't pushed it as hard or as fast as I would want to have been, but we're seeing every every day we see changes and developments in our testing capability. And I think you know what, what Michael Gove and, and Boris was was talking about you know, was as we move to the actually to the antigen testing, where we can test people who either have had COVID nineteen or got through it. You know, so that's why we're looking. You know, and that, that's why. As I said, even in my opening comments, you know, we're looking at the MOT centres and we're looking at actually that development down at the the, the Odyssey. So when so when that ability comes online and we have are able to ramp up, uh, we we can complete that. So uh, in my opening comments, I said, look, and, and I suppose just to make the committee members um, clear, this moment in time, uh, we're we're pushing our t our testing capability, which was mainly based in the the Belfast Virology Lab. We've now pushed that out into a number of trusts and to actually the ambulance services as, as well, so that there's testing going on across the health estate. The current work that we're doing uh, on pushing into is actually pushing into our AFP labs. So when I say, sorry, I'm asking you is what are the problems thus far that have ensured that testing hasn't been taking place at a rate? That would be oh, desirable. Sorry, 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 sorry. Look, I suppose the, the challenges that, that we've had um, locally uh, and the number of tests that we're, uh, the number of tests that we've been able to do is actually the availability of, of the products on the supply chain themselves. So when we were starting off with our, you know the small capacity we had, we were able to manage that and keep it up. But as we've ramped up, there has been challenges. Uh, you know, even in regards to the reagents that, that are available, and I think even you know, the labs in the Republic of Ireland are, are seeing that as well. The other thing is being on top is make sure that the staff that is actually doing this have the, has the appropriate uh, training uh, and accreditation. So, you know, those, those challenges all, have all been something that we've been working through. So, 
as we ramp up, as, as at each stage, as, as the health of state has been ramping up its testing capability, is because we've been, we've been overcoming those hurdles that we've had that we've had in house. Um, yeah, and it's also been trying to, you know, when we've been trying that, there's been a lot of talk, you know, about the commercial tests that, that were available and why we were not just buying those off the shelf. Um, we were waiting to make sure... Are you worried about that, Robin? What, what, would, what would prefer? It's hard doing this over the phone, because, you know, as you know yourself, you know yourself, if you're sitting at the other end of a committee table, it's far easier to see to see where, 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 where the answers go and whether that's the direction you want to take. I suppose what, what I'm asking is, I mean, we knew from uh, early January when uh, China was screaming about what was coming down the tracks at us, uh, and to a large extent it was ignored. Uh, it was ignored in Italy, and only when the, the, the number of infections and the number of people dying began to rise exponentially, Italy started screaming too about what was required. And the most successful countries to date have been in Asia, uh, in South Korea, in Singapore, in Japan, and China itself, where there has been large-scale testing, uh, contact tracing, and isolation. And I mean, one of the reasons there is an absolute need for testing on as wide a scale as possible is that many of those who are carrying this infection have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever, which means they can be out and about in the community spreading the virus further. Now, we knew in early January what was coming down the tracks at us. What preparations were put in place from then, and how have they been ramped up since then? In regards to the point you make about isolation, um, Pat, you know, and, and this was one of the things we did at the very start, and I think that's the, the, the proactive step we took. You know, when we were telling anybody who thought they were symptomatic or were showing symptoms, actually to self-isolate. So what we were taking even at that early stage was asking those people who were asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, to actually take themselves out of that, out, out of the general public and out of the wider public to prevent the spread of that. And I suppose that's in regards to what we've been actually doing and what we've been actually enforcing and asking people to do over the past number of weeks is, is the isolation that we're actually having at the, this minute in time and the social distancing is exactly that, that aim. So we, we remove not only those who are, are, are carrying COVID-19 and who are asymptomatic, but also those who are vulnerable and may be more susceptible to, to suffering the worst, worst cases should they, should they contact it to take them out of the system at this minute in time. So, so the steps that we're taking now um, will have that impact and that, that effect uh, as to stop the further spread of, of COVID-19. So that, that, that's why we're preaching. That's why we're asking people, you know, observe the social distancing when you can't stay in the house, stay in the house, and, you know, prevent the spread of this, this, this virus getting any further within the, the concepts of Northern Ireland. Yes are testing on a very small scale. And the, the, uh, the CMO himself said, uh, probably over a week ago now, that there were probably thousands out there who are infected. If we weren't doing testing on a large scale, how do we know where the virus is? Do we know where there are any clusters? Well, we're working at this moment in time, Pat. That's why we're asking everybody to stay in the house in regards to, to the testing we're, we're te we're targeting the testing capability that we have. But I, I said in the early situation, in the early con I want to see as much testing in Northern Ireland as we can practically and physic physically do. That's why we're pushing this. That's why we're ramping it up. That's why we're challenging across the government departments, across our private and public sector, and our universities to bring them online. And we're also part of that greater, you know, the UK uh, wide contract in, in the testing capability that has engaged our, our commercial sector. So it's not that we're, we're, we're ignoring it or we're not doing testing. We're pushing here to get as much testing as is as physically possible up and running. But Robin, I mean, let, let's deal with the facts. There was resistance, uh, particularly uh, across the water, to the uh, initiation of a large-scale testing exercise. Is that not the case? Paul, I'm, I'm not caught talking about what happened across the water. I'm talking about what we did here. You know, we've, we've been... Are we not following the lead from there? No, we're 
following our only we're doing our own, own thing here we're taking guidance from the chief medical officer who who works as part of that uh, UK wide chief you know the chief medical officer and they come and give us guidance and advice to us and that's what well, we're then, that's you see the Robin that that's why I'm asking you to explain uh, the steps that have been taken since January since we knew about this uh, and given that we know what has been happening in other countries where they've been able to suppress uh, the disease, that they have carried out large-scale testing. Uh, Germany at the minute is testing half a million people a week. You know, so uh, I'm, I'm asking you, I mean, how many more test kits have been procured since January? How many did we have in January and how many do we have now? There's still a relatively small number of people here being tested. Yesterday it was 565, despite there being a target of, of uh, is it 11 or 1,400? Uh, uh, yeah, our, our, tar our target on our push is to get up to 1,100, Pat. And you know, I, that, that's where we're pushing to do. That. And it's not something that we're knowing, and I don't want you to try and portray that we're, the Department of Health has not focused or targeted and trying to push up the numbers of people we're testing, because that's I think that's unfair because that's where we are concentrating and that's what we want to do. But we have to focus the tests that we have. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there doesn't appear to have been any preparatory work done in the last three months uh, to ensure that there was a process of large-scale testing of the population. No, no, there doesn't. I mean, I'm asking you now, how many test kits did we have in January and how many do we have now? How many have we procured since January? Uh, what other training has been done to ensure that the virology lab will have sufficient uh, personnel to carry out the tests? Is the virology lab open 24 hours a day? Or in my understanding, it's still only operating on a nine to five basis. Is that, is that true? But the, the, as I said earlier on, where we're pushing with it is about capability of I suppose, of the equipment that we have as well and the number of cells we can run at any one time. So in regards to the, the testing of, of individuals, there, there's a small pool of people who are working in the virology lab, and that's why we're bringing in and second and, and working with other people from across from across AFPE, from across the departments, and now pushing that out into the trust as well. So th this isn't... The, uh, and, and I suppose one of the things in regards to testing, it's not just some something you can take or somebody you can bring in from a, from a I suppose an ordinary lab and, and set them up and get them running. Uh, it takes time, it takes accreditation because we want to make sure that the tests that we're putting out and the results that we're putting out, we can actually rely on uh, them being valid as well. Because the, the, the worst thing that could actually happen is you could say to somebody that they don't have COVID-19 when they actually do, and we could be putting them back out into society um, where they could be actually spreading the virus. Just um, and, and, and finally, I mean, th this isn't just me who's saying that this. There are experts out in the field in epidemiology and infectious diseases and public health. People like Gabriel Scali, Alton Parr, who was on the radio this morning, Michael J. Rand from the World Health Organization, Sam McCon Professor Sam McConkey in, in, in Trinity in Dublin. All of these people are crying out for uh, more testing, test, trace and isolate. Uh, sorry, Robin, how much time do you have here today? Half eleven, Pat. I was on, but... I'll, I'll bring in Colm at this oh, point. Pat, Pat, can I, can I just sorry. I, I'm pushing to get as much testing as we can possibly do. Don't, don't be under any illusion that it's not something that, that I don't want to see more of, because it's crucial that for, for those three target groups that we have, plus more, and more of our key workers as, as we get through this epidemic, that we can get as much testing capability that we can here in Northern Ireland. Okay. Colm? Colm Gildernew? Yes, Colm here. Can you hear me there? Okay. Go ahead. Robin, just as a follow-up to that, that, last, um, that last there, you said that you want to see as much testing as we can practically do. And in light of that, have you directly bought any tests from Randox? Um, Randolph's column are actually, we had a good conversation with Randolph's when they found out, when they got the final uh, word that they have been accredited. Uh, Randolph's are part of the UK-wide uh, contract for for testing. So they're tied well, into well, that. You, the, the, sorry, you, call, call them, hold on. Sorry. They're, they're part, 
they're, they're tied into that UK wide uh, contract for for testing, which we benefit from, which we'll get a number of of samples out of, uh, de- depending where they actually come from. We got a small run from from them at the very start, but they're now tied into that national contract where they're actually supplying supplying their test kit into there. But we've we've been uh, no and talks about how how our labs can actually work with them to support their testing capability. Are you seriously telling me, Robin, that a local company here manufacturing these kits, you're allowing those those kits to be sent out of the country, they will then come back in at some future point in time, what you refer to as an allocation. And and, and this is this is in, in, in bearing in mind the fact that Robin is saying that there's four hundred million items of PPE that we're still waiting on. Why would a local company that's manufacturing the test kits that we need be allowed to send those out and then they may come back after after some notional list of England, Scotland, Wales, a company that's been supported here and, and supported here by our investment uh, agencies. Uh, Colin, uh, allowing a, a commercial company to to, to do that, uh, it's not within my remit. As I said, we, we, we've been we've been talking with Ron Docks and we've been supporting them as to how they actually utilise equipment here as well. So the, 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 com- the commerciality of the, the contract that they have negotiated with with the United Kingdom as, as without as without my scope. But why why have you not negotiated the contract with them yourself, Robert? Be- because that that contract had already been negotiated on a UK wide basis. As I say, we got we got a small part um, of initial test kits that they were able to provide us, but they're now working to that the national contract which we're part of. Um, we're actually getting uh, we're, we're actually getting benefit and allocation out of. We're getting a small part, you've said, Robin. That, that, that wasn't, that wasn't inspired. I was, well, so, sorry. I, I, I find that unbelievable, Robin. Sorry, sorry. Call, call, call him. Rather, sorry. Sorry. My, my phraseology, I apologize. I'll, I'll get you to the exact number we're getting out of it. That's, that's phrase, sorry. That's, that's, that's language more than, than technicality. Well, I apologize. I, 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 I certainly would, but, but I would like, I would like further, I'd like further, Robin, that you go back to Rondox and say, listen, we, we, we need a certain amount of kits for our population. Base it on the modeling. We can, we can see that, that we need to identify where the clusters are. We need to be doing more testing to get ahead of this. So we yeah. definitely want to see those numbers. Yeah, okay. Now, my second question then is in relation to, there was a, a Guardian article last week, and I know your department responded to it, that uh, itemized that there was in, internal stock checks done in relation to PPA, and that the stock check listed item after item of personal protective equipment as out of stock. Uh, so I'm asking, first of all, can you can you commit to get, to uh, sharing the document, the product shortage document or documents with the committee? And second of all, I want to ask you, in light of that I raised with you some time ago about the EU procurement for both ventilators and PPE stocks, have you actioned that at an EU level that, that we can avail of supplies coming in via the EU? Colm, in, in regards to the leaked document, I, I haven't had, uh, sorry, I haven't had sight of it. I don't know, but we'll, we'll have a look. In regards to procurement, as, as I've also said, you know, and I said in my own comments, um, we've had a very good conversation and working in cooperation with uh, Connor Murphy uh, and uh, well, the Department of Finance, Finance through CPD. So we're, we're exploring three, three directions of uh, of supply for PPE. That's both nationally, which is that part that Pat was talking about, was access to um, drawn down stuff from the UK stockpile. Um, and that, that, that's underway and that's coming. Uh, in regards, we're also working with, with the Irish government uh, in regards to, you know, I don't know if they're part of the UK procurement or not, but I know that we're working with them and that procurement from from China, and that, and that is a substantial order that, that we're, we're working on and bringing in. And the third one is in regards to what the local capability is here as well. So, uh, as part of, a, of an EU procurement, no, we're not, because Connor and I have been working, as I say, on those three chains of, of supply for PPE. Okay, well, listen, I'll finish on this because I want to give everyone else a chance. But you mentioned in your, in your remarks that you're well aware of the uh, concern around PPE. And that, yeah. you've, that there's a rapid review of current guidance being taken. Now, bear in mind that frontline healthcare staff need to be protected, ambulance staff 
You also have the issue of care homes where there where have been identified clusters in other countries, so we can expect that. Those need to be facilitated with equipment. Funeral directors need to be facilitated with the correct equipment to manage this, this, this situation. So in light of that, any review, I, I believe we all agree, will lead to a dramatic increase in the need for PPE. What steps are being taken now to secure the equipment that will be needed? Well, that's, uh, as I say, one of the things we did, you know, at least part of our pandemic stockpile at the beginning of last week to make sure that there is stuff in the supply chain. And this making sure, as I said, you know, in the opening, I know I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but uh, it's making sure that the stocks that we're pushing out into trust do make it down onto wards and do make it into the care homes as well. Because we do acknowledge, you know, the significance of, of, of care homes and those clustered living accommodation facilities. And that's why when we talk about our level of who, who, who can avail of a test and who, you know, who's prioritised in that test, that's why those here in that clustered uh, living sector uh, is actually prioritised as well. So that okay. if, we do, if we do see an incidence um, in, a, in a care home, and we have a, we have a number of care homes where we, where we have, a, have a positive cases that, that we are able to put in those support measures should it be you no know, additional testing around those who are in the direct proximity or, or the staff who have been directly working, but also to make sure that they have the PPE that, that they need to provide the support that they're giving to those people who are in those, those, those given, living, living yeah. accommodations. Given, given that the modelling the model that you have, you have issued there, Robin, has shown there's going to be 400 people at a reasonable worst case and many, many more in a worst case scenario, 400 requiring oxygen, 180 requiring ventilation, how many ventilators do we have in the system now, and what? How many ventilators are on the way, and when will they arise? Uh, oh, oh uh, hold on, just a minute here, to make sure I have. We have 165 um, in in the system at, at this minute in time. Um, there's 190 coming as our part of the UK alloc allocation. We we have 650, approximately 700 breathing support. Um, apparatus uh, also in, in order because I suppose the thing to be aware of that uh, in regards to to those who need ventilated and those who need additional um, oxygen support, it's not on the same same intensification or, or the same their uh, I suppose invasive nature. So so we're out of the middle with 165 in the minute with more due um, within the next couple of weeks because again that's something you know. Talking again with with Connor and and DFP, we've been working on that uh, jointly to make sure that we're pushing every avenue that we can, and even in regards to uh, is there availability elsewhere across the international sphere to make sure that we can we we can max up the ventilators that we we currently have, but also those in line as well. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Colm. Pam, did you want to come in now? Uh, sorry, members. Sorry, Pam. Just before you start, could I could I just say, if we can keep our questions concise, uh, and if the minister could answer concisely as well, it would be helpful, and we get as much as much uh, as possible done in the time left. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for your time today once again. Um, in terms of um, testing, Minister, and you'll be aware that there's. Uh, some uh, news around uh, Cambridge University and the possible um, technology there, um, HIV testing, which can be kind of converted into uh, COVID-19 diagnostic testing, which could give results within 19 minutes. And do you know anything about that, Minister? Is that being actively um, looked at in terms of uh, a testing solution? And as well as that, I wanted to ask you about in terms of PPE, I think the subject's been well rehearsed already this morning, but are we looking at the um, the offers from um, our own people on the ground, people here at home, people here seamstress who are offering to make PPE, even, you know, I think every piece of equipment that we can get our hands on will come in useful. So are you, is, it, is the department actually looking at what individuals can do and what they can supply? and also um, schools or businesses that may have some form of PPE. And uh, just to finish then, Minister, on the GP letter issue, and you mentioned that there um, that there will be extra 
um, letters going out, maybe not from GPs but from trust, to make sure you've um, caught all those vulnerable people who are out there. How many extra letters do you think will be coming out and how long will they take to come out? And then on the back of that, the people who have been asked to shield for 12 weeks, what happens, Minister, at the end of those 12 weeks? Uh, what will the direction be for them in light of the fact that we know we will be highly unlikely to have any type of vaccine for this coronavirus? Okay, um, thanks, Pam. Uh, in regards to, to the GP letters that, that we actually issued, um, now th those were from from the first trawl of, uh, I suppose, the, the database and, and the health records that we were able to, to get out for those people who, who have been identified. <laughs> People with solid organ transplant recipients, um, people with specific cancers, people with severe uh, respiratory conditions, including you know cystic fibrosis, severe asthma, severe COPD, and then people with rare diseases and inborn uh, errors of metabolism and you know high risk infections, people who are immu immunosuppressant therapies, and um, people with uh, people who are pregnant and with a significant heart disease, uh, whether that be congenital. Or acquired now that that detail is I suppose online just in case I, I, I missed anyone. But what, what we're concerned about and what the Health and Social Care Board is actually doing is making sure now the GPs have trolled all their systems uh, and is making sure the Health and Social Care Board is now going through um, going through their records, hospital records, to make sure there's nobody has been overlooked or or missed uh, within that group uh, or those groupings. In regards to the 12 to in regards to the 12 to, to 14 weeks um, shielding, and I suppose that's where our modelling will will start to start to st start to play out. The longer we can we can actually see it run and what effect it is having, um, whether we can take our our foot or our pressure off some of the mo or some of the some of the measures we're currently taking um, to allow people to get back out into the society and any social distancing a bit. So the 12 to 14 weeks um, shielding, that, you know, that's the long term. That's, I suppose, the more dramatic request we're making at this minute in time to make sure that they are secure and they're shielded in their house. But it's also that they're 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 they're, they're not isolated from society, but they're shielded from from the virus. Is what I think we're trying to to make sure that is actually happening at this minute in time. It is challenging. as it it's challenging for individuals and families, but. It's something that, that we need to do. In, in regards to, to businesses supplying uh, PPE, we're already seeing that and we're already taking offers um, from different different organisations, different businesses who, who are no longer producing. Um, so we can take that back into our stockpile. But as, as I've said before as well, we need to make sure the validity um, of that personal protective equipment so that we're not not putting something in, into the front line that, that isn't up to isn't up to standard or up, up to scratch. But in regards to, you know, you mentioned our, our own businesses and um, that's one, you know, that's it, it, one, as, as I said, it's our third line of of supply for PPE. And I think it's one of the things that has really been impressive here in Northern Ireland where you see the likes of blog blinds, you know, who used to make... They used to make blinds for, for windows who have now turned their complete production line around and now making face shields. Um, for us, uh, for Anils, um, who at one stage were having to lay off uh, large numbers of the workforce, who are now making scrubs for our nurses. So it, it's really the organisations and businesses um, who want to adapt and turn their production lines uh, to support that PPE push are being engaged with us. It's um, actually through through CPD, through the Department of Finances, and we're working with Invest NI. I don't know, know that that central location been done yes, been done through them to make sure we can actually support make sure we can support our businesses at this modern time Medicine because one of the concerns is could I could I interrupt you uh, and, and you've made that point well I'm just wondering could we move on then because uh, time's pushing on uh, could I ask Paula Bradshaw to come in. Um, thank you, um, Minister. Thank you for that update on the um, additional ventilators that you've ordered. But can you please let us know if any extra corporeal membrane oxygenators, which um, are used whenever ventilation fails, whether you have ordered any of those as well? Um, my understanding is that there are only 25 currently in the UK. Can you let us know how many you've purchased? And if you haven't purchased any, are you not concerned that patients may die? 
That's the first question. The second um, was relating to you, you talked about the rapid review of guidance in terms of PPE. Minister, there are staff members, healthcare workers in levels four, um, six, seven, eight, and nine of the tar block in Belfast City Hospital who are incredibly concerned. They have not been fitted yet for masks, but we know that patients are already being moved. We can't wait for this updated guidance review. These people are going to be taking COVID-19 positively <coughs> tested patients today, tomorrow and over the weekend. So I would ask you to move on that in terms of the fitting. You said the PPA is there. We need to make sure that it fits properly. And the last question is, Minister, if you could provide us with an update on how women in Northern Ireland during the travel restrictions during this pandemic are going to have access to abortion services here in Northern Ireland as they are in the rest of the UK and in the South. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Paul. Your first question in regards to, to ECMO, I think it was you were, you were talking about, uh, as, as, as the uh, as, as, as it's actually a very specialised um, service in regards to respiratory. We don't have any here in Northern Ireland, so it won't be just to be a matter of of purchasing one because we I don't think we currently have the the staff who can do that. The agno provision that we have in Northern Ireland is actually done, and I think it's the same in, the same across the UK. It's actually a centralised service, so we have we we have guaranteed access to um to to, to use that facility as and when we need it. So that's where we know the, the likes of of their ambulance. Um, will be will be utilised. So, so that's the access we have to ECMO at this minute in time. If there's a more up to date um, um, response, I can give you to that. I will. In regards to the mask fitting for those on on six, seven, eight, and nine, um, that's for the uh, the FFP3 masks, which we do make sure for sure are fitted properly. Uh, I'll follow up on that with with the Belfast Trust. Because I know that is a piece of work that is ongoing and, and should be should be actually well underway. But if uh, if it's not, I'll, I'll contact the, the Belfast Trust after this call. I mean, just to see to see where we where we're at. Because the, the last thing I want is actually is to to put our healthcare workers under under any more strain um, than they already are at this point in time. Uh, and your last point here uh, in regards to to the support of women who. Who, who are seeking abortion? Um, I, as you're aware, um, it, it is a sensitive um, issue in Northern Ireland. It's a cross-cutting uh, issue in Northern Ireland as well, and it's not one solely for the Department of Health. So it's actually something that uh, has there will be, I suppose, a presentation, a paper presented to to the executive uh, at the meeting tomorrow, which will present a number of of options as to how we proceed uh, with that. Um, so it is because of the cross-cutting sensitive nature um, that abortion is in Northern Ireland. That's 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 where that is that is currently at. So that paper will be presented uh, for the executive to discuss tomorrow. Well, Minister, thank you for, for that. I, I, I would disagree with the last point. I'm not entirely sure that it is a cross-departmental issue. I think that this rests solely with you. We've already heard that there have been two women who have attempted suicide this week. There are 20 to 30 women each week who travel to England for these services. So this is of the utmost importance that you deal with this as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Time's moving on. I take a number of questions from, from members that are left uh, and do your best to answer them in the time that's left. Okay, okay, we'll do our best. Jerry, uh, yeah. <coughs> thanks, sir. Sure. Then Colin, um, Alex. Just, just in regards to the PPE, I mean, the minister said there's no shortage, but people still aren't getting it. I've been contacted by physios uh, who are without the correct uh, equipment, and many of them have been threatened with disciplinary action for raising the concern. So I don't think. Look, a quick answer. If you've got physios who are threatened, disciplinary action, fire me through the details. Important to try and get some questions and answers on these questions. Um, yeah. So PPE still isn't getting the workers. Ventilators. Um, in, in January, the World Health Organization war warned about this pandemic. Um, I believe that we're still uh, slow to require ventilators. We still don't have enough. Um, and I'd ask the minister, does he think that we're uh, ill-equipped at the minute to prepare, uh, and do we have enough ventilators? Because I think we don't uh, at the minute. Uh, and just quickly, um, 
uh, in regards to testing, I mean, to me, it, it's shocking that there was been there was 400 million. Um, sorry, there was there was testing uh, provided. Um, Randax was mentioned, um, but we still don't have enough testing being uh, rolled out. Uh, it's still slow to happen. Um, I, I would ask the minister why the executive still hasn't taken control of places like Randox to provide them with public testing on, on a wide uh, scale. And I want to finally support Paula's comments. I think uh, the Department of Health has to issue um, tablets for women to get access to medical terminations uh, at this time. Okay, thanks for that, Jerry. Um, Robin, before you come in, Colin, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. And I know I probably won't get the answers now because the Minister's under time pressure, but um, just the, the, the slant on PPE of the private nursing sector, where they're finding that whenever they call a lot of their suppliers, the suppliers have been told that the stuff has to be directed to the NHS. So it's just about that. I can't call at all there. Okay, well. He, he, he's, not, he's not out of make. He's going to uh, allow someone else to come in. Alex? Yeah, um, three questions, <laughs> if I'm correct. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, Could you keep it to two, Alex? Ooh, we'll have to toss a coin here. Um, the first one is care in the community, staff that work for the trusts. Um, I have to declare an interest. My daughter works for that. Um, and they're not being issued with masks. And they were given a directive that unless somebody tests positive for coronavirus, that they have to go in without masks. Can you confirm that, and if that's a directive? And secondly, have you got any equipment sent from the Republic of Ireland? Um, I know you're working with them, and that's good to see. And I'm wondering, is there any equipment come down from them? And has there been a problem with some of the equipment that they've been getting from China? That I've heard that some stuff is having to be sent back, such as masks and stuff like that. Okay, and Orlea, you wanted to come in? Yes, Pat, thank you. And thank you to the Minister. Look, just really quickly, and um, if you can't cover this in, in any great detail, um, uh, Robin, I would really appreciate maybe just some of it back in writing because, again, it's a massive issue in and around the, the mental health um, problems that we're facing. I know that Paula and Jerry touched on, on the abortion stuff, and we can see how that's having a direct impact. On, on someone and being in the position that they're seeing they take their own lives, so it needs to be addressed. But just more broadly, Robin, we are being contacted um, by a number of health and social care staff. They're obviously um, at the, the, the cold face of this here, and it's starting to impact psychologically on them. So, um, again, so we're not too slow out of the traps on this. Is there any measures that are being put in place? What plans are there to make sure that our health and social care staff in particular are going to have the support, the psychological support that they're going to need to deal with the trauma um, that's facing us all here over the next couple of weeks and months. Finally, Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, recently there's been a lot of uh, media comment from Professor Scully, as well as a number of uh, political commentators who have just turned scientists, who have been encouraging your department to take another direction. Uh, is this proven to be an unhelpful distraction for your department? And the other question is, pharmacists are expressing concern how they are going to pay huge drugs bills at the end of this month, exacerbated by a loss of ancillary sales. Uh, what plans does uh, the department have to assist them? In, in reverse, and apologies, Chair, I probably have about five or ten minutes here, but just in reverse for, for the questions that I actually remember. In regards to, to community pharmacy, we met with community pharmacy about a week ago now. We've put in, or I've agreed to put in an extra ten and a half million uh, support to them at this moment in time because I'm aware of the changes that they do have to make even to their facilities by we get over this. So, the, the pharm pharmacy is a vital support, vital part of, of our fight back against COVID. So we're working very closely with them to make sure they're there uh, to support that. And in regards to to, to the, the, the the commentary, uh, Alan, um, they're not a they're not a distraction for me. Um, you know, the only thing I'd be concerned is the number of people out there here. They're either misinformed or ill-informed. Um, that actually some of their commentary may cast doubts and undermine the guidance that we're actually putting out there. Now, I, I'm not naming anybody individually on that, but it just would caution people just to be, you know, be careful in, in their their approach of what they do. Uh, or in regards to mental health, that's a piece of work that the, the department has, has already undertaken because we are aware 
um, of the large, I suppose, the stress and strain that our, our healthcare workers are being, being put under at this moment in time because the worry and the concern that's been felt across, across society has been focused um, on those healthcare workers as well. So, so that's, that, that's a piece of work that's on, that, that has started, I'm not saying it's ongoing, it's actually started and we're actually reaching out to make sure that anybody who needs support um, will we'll get it. Uh, Alex, in regard to, to PPE and the guidance, as I say, the guidance uh, earlier on, the guidance has been worked across our, our chief medical officers, chief nursing officers, and the input for the Secretary General of, of the RCM uh, in regards to how we, we look at um, the, the PPE. Uh, and I think that's going to be ta taking place actually on a, a place-based approach so that those people in secondary care, primary care, and community care get that. Now we have we have supplied our own advice and guidance to those in, in the, the the community care sector. Um, I'm trying to think, Jerry, come back come back to your points. The nationalisation of, of companies is not something that's in within our remit or our power at this moment in time, but it's utilising and what is there um, in regards to you know your comments and others' comments, Paula's comments about abortion. Um, it is as a, a cross-cutting um, issue because of, of of what it is in Northern Ireland, and that's why that's why I have to refer to I'm referring it uh, to the executive. Um, is there anything else there? Quickly, Pat. Sorry, there was a number of quick fire questions, and I, I don't think I've picked up them all. But Ms. Lambert, uh, the minister has. Oh, Colin says he will email you his questions. Uh, oh, that's it. Nothing else then, members? Okay, Robin, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, Just before I go, can I, can I once again thank, um, thank the committee and its members for, for the support they are giving, especially to, to our healthcare workers, but also to just keep reinforcing that message in regards to, to social distancing and the, the isolation bit. When we put out the reasonable worst case scenario, uh, people's actions today, tomorrow, next week can have a direct effect on those numbers that are in our reasonable worst case scenario. So it just as an ask um, from me, to, from the committee members, if you can just keep keep reinforcing that message and the importance um, of the social distancing and observing the, I, I suppose the, the 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 guidance and the asks that that, that have come from the executive. At this moment in time, so we can really make sure that Northern Ireland can respond um, to the crisis and our healthcare system as fit to cope, Chair. So that's just a, a final few words. If I appreciate what you are doing, and if you can keep just pushing that message. Okay. Thanks. Just one final uh, request, Robin. I'm wondering, could you give the committee in rating the strategy and guidance for testing and how the prioritisation has <coughs> worked out? I just, certainly, Chair, I'll get that. I'll get that across because we have we have an updated we have an updated version of that going to to the executive as well. So I'll definitely share that with you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, members, we do not do the other business first or minutes and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll go back to <coughs> item three. Sure. Sorry. Just, can I sure. maybe, can I give my couple of questions and have them maybe facilitated officially through the the, the liaison officer rather than certainly. Um, I suppose just given that maybe the background <coughs> staff could talk to a couple of teenagers. All teenagers in this world seem to be able to communicate, but it seems to be a difficulty um, in here. Um, just the issue was about nursing home um, staff and about the fact that they are telling me on the ground that they're having difficulty accessing the PPE because when they go to their suppliers, the suppliers are saying that all of their equipment has been sent into the National Health Service, which is, you know, there's a right and a wrong in there, but it's about maybe just making sure that there's um, equal sort of um, distribution of, of that PPE. Um, and I, I did want to ask the Minister as well about just do we have full and proper faith in our Chief Medical Officer because last week he clearly told us that testing wasn't important uh, and then the rhetoric changes in London 
and all of a sudden this week it's the most urgent thing that has to be sorted. You know, all I think political parties have been saying for weeks that, that testing needed to be sorted out, and we were knocked back and knocked back. And then all of a sudden, whenever Boris decides to change his mind, all of a sudden over here it's the most important thing. And I think it's been happening in the, the southern half of the island. And I think if we had that all island approach, it would be much more helpful. But we need to understand the decision making process behind that change of testing uh, and understand at what point did it become important whenever last week we were clearly told that it wasn't important. And um, I suppose we, we did ask last week as well, raise the issue of the pay for student nurses. Now, some are saying that it is happening, some are saying that it's not happening. But if they have taken the decision to pay nurses, student nurses, it would be great to, to raise that because that's a, a good news story and amongst all of the, the bad news that we have. Um, and yeah, that, I, I, there were some questions about ventilators. I think again, we're going to come to the stage of needing to know the nuts and the bolts of that. Like, how many do we need? How many do we have? How many have we ordered? And when will we get them? Just very clear questions that, that will give us faith that things are being done right. And, and, and that applies to the testing kits as well, because it's not just a matter of using a cotton bud to go and do a bit of a few swabs and that's it. There's a particular test kit that's required, and there does appear to be a shortage of those. But okay, Cathy uh, Jack, the chief executive of the Belfast Trust, is going to join us at some stage. We'll hear her voice when she's when she's ready to join in. In the meantime, I suggest we move on with the other uh, items on the agenda. <coughs> Item three is the draft minutes uh, of the meeting held on the 26th of March, which are at tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Uh, Chair, can I come in, please? Or Liam? Yes, or Liam, go ahead. Yes, it was just a wee uh, point that I noticed whenever I was reading through the minutes. Now, I know it, it was a wee bit difficult last week for, for Pam and Elish because I was obviously just communicating through email and wasn't physically present at the meeting, um, but in, in the, the email that I had sent for the issue to be raised it was in and around the um, proposing the Department of Health um, to insert some sort of a sunset clause, so as a sort of additional safeguard measure to the, um, the statutory rules in relation to the coronavirus. And I know, um, as I was listening online, there was a bit of discussion um, amongst the committee members around it, and the agreement the agreement Has was joined the conference. The agreement was um, to reflect that conference or to reflect the SRs within the forward work program of the committee. Um, but I would just like it to be noted um, in the minutes that the, the proposal uh, was submitted um, to encourage the, the, the inclusion of the sunset clause as an additional safeguard. If I can maybe consider that and bring that back to committee under convention and practice, we don't record proposals. We record decisions taken by the committee, and the committee decision in regard to all the subordinate legislation arising out of coronavirus was taken after some discussion and is recorded under item eight. There, um, the committee agreed to add consideration of COVID-19 related subordinate legislation to its forward work programme for a review, um, having discussed the point that the committee could then recommend that it be revoked or amended in line with the committee's findings at that time. I can take that away and discuss further. Well, are, you, are you happy, Orlea, for Elish to take that away and discuss it with you further? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I, I think we have uh, the Chief Executive of the Belfast Trust, Cathy Jack, on the line. Are you there, Cathy? Yes, Chair. Cathy. Welcome to the committee. I'm Pat Sheehan. I'm acting as chair for today. Uh, the chair and vice chair are unable to attend. Uh, there, there are a number of us here in the Senate chamber in Parliament buildings, uh, and another few, three I think, who are joining us remotely. So, uh, first of all, I want to welcome you. Uh, I, I want to commend you and all your staff in, in the Belfast Trust. And I know it's the job of health and social care workers to take care of patients and to save lives. That's, that's what happens day and daily. 
the situation we're in at the minute is different in so far as not only uh, are your staff uh, saving lives, but they're putting their own lives at risk uh, going into work on a day and daily basis. So uh, I'm sure everyone at the committee will concur with me when I uh, commend all your staff uh, and, and wish them uh, well, th that they're health healthy and safe uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So, uh, Kathy, uh, I don't know if you want to give a, a short presentation or whether you just want some questions. Uh, and I wonder just how much time do you have to give us? Uh, Chair, um, I have to join, I think, another call around uh, one o'clock. Um, but for, for you, I wanted to just say I wanted to thank you and your colleagues round the table for their support at this extraordinary time. You're absolutely correct. The selflessness in the staff, particularly those on the front line who are putting themselves at risk when the world steps back, they step forward, is second to none. And our staff have been outstanding. Um, so that, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, I'm very happy to take your questions. Uh, I'm sure you have um, a number. If I cannot give you the absolute information today, because you know this is emerging and evolving fast, I will take it away and give a commitment to come back to you within 24 hours. Thanks for that. And I, I, I'm going to uh, open up first by asking the chair and deputy chair to come in, and I'll come in at a later stage, seeing as I hogged so much of the previous uh, uh, item of, of business. Uh, so, Colm Gildernew? Do you want to come in? Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Paul. Um, and, and I want to, I want to uh, also endorse Pat's comments there in relation to the work that everyone is doing and, and yourself and the trust. And I know you have worked on a number of things there over the past while. Um, so thank you for that. I suppose my question would be in relation to PPE. And there's there's conflicting chain of signals about the amount of PPE that's available the amount of PPE that's getting distributed across and within the trusts. So can you give us an idea of how you're fixed at the minute in terms of equipment, and are there difficulties with getting that distributed within your trust area? Okay, so PPE is many things. So we have sufficient surgical masks, that's the fluid masks, the aprons and the gloves, etc. The biggest challenge at the moment is a special type of respiratory mask or the FFP3, and that is a challenge, and it's a challenge worldwide, and in Northern Ireland, it's no different. We do have a number of stocks of that, but every single different type of mask needs to be fit tested for the individual. So we have over 6,000 staff tested on a specific type of mask called the 1895. Now, this mask is required whenever there's aerosol generating, um, so in intubations, in suction, um, and doing high complex care that you would see in an intensive care or indeed in a respiratory positive COVID ward. Those stocks are currently um, limited. We were getting a, a shipment of 60,000 in, um, and we had expected our share, which was over 10,000. That did not happen. We got just over 1,000 at the beginning of the week. Whereas we have another mask, which is 8833, we have 8,000 in stock, and we have an assurance from the department and BSO that we're getting 30,000 more. But at the moment, there is only 666 staff fit tested for that. They are in our high-risk areas, and we are able to fit test 240 staff per day on that. So we are making sure that we match our requirements to make sure that our staff are protected. But PPE, and in particular, the FFP3, is a real challenge for us. And we are doing everything we can to protect our staff and make sure they are fit tested and have the right equipment at the right time. Right, Pat, just lost a second. Yes, yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Kathy, for that. 
I'll, I'll, I'll move on there and allow others in as well. Just, just to say that is our central store in Belfast, the ward areas. Then once we release it to the ward areas, we no longer count it. We count it as it's being used in reality. So this is our central store, but we have 30,000 more of the 8833 coming today. And, and had the department indicated, Cathy, when the FFP3 mass of supply of those will be coming through to you in the numbers required? So the 60,000, I understand, was in transport um, and was turned back. So they expect it now next week. Um, Do you know why that was turned back? No, I don't. I'm not party to that. That was BSO told us. Okay, well that's obviously very, very concerning, but I think that's something we we'll need to we we'll need to follow up. Um, okay, thanks for that, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, Pam Cameron. Yep, Pam, Chair. You to... um, thank you, Kathy, very much for um, being um, able to come on to the health committee today, and just to say that. We absolutely understand the um, the pivotal the pivotal and frontline role and um, response to COVID nineteen that that you and the the trust are um, managing and you're absolutely right the self and self um, has been outstanding by staff and I just want to commend each and every one of you on that. Um, in terms of PPE, Cathy, um, how is the trust ensuring that charitable contributions from businesses and individuals are being harnessed in the most effective way um, for meeting demand? And then uh, my second question to you would be in terms of visiting um, members of the public. Uh, are they abiding by the ban on visiting? Um, and who is the trust working with to ensure enforcement of that? And also our Wi-Fi systems within the hospital setting are they capable of sustaining virtual visiting by video calling? Okay, so thank you for those. Um, the first one was about PPE, char charitable donations of PPE. So yes. first of all, we have a key contact um, through our Director of Nursing where all charitable donations should be channeled because these charitable donations can be anything from perishable food through to gowns, masks, scrubs. Uh, and we're overwhelmed by the generosity of local people, um, small businesses, etc., in supporting us at this time. But we have a key contact that we're promoting on social media and also in our daily COVID update across all our staff so that we can manage this safely um, and make sure that they are equally distributed to the areas of need. Um, so we do have a key contact and we can share that with you if that would be helpful. That would be very helpful, Cathy, because we would like to do our bit in any way we can to share that information out. And I know the public are very, very keen to help out in any way they can, so that would be appreciated. So we, we'll share that with you after the call. The second uh, question was about visiting. The, the ban on visiting has gone live, as you know, um, one parent, if they've got a child in, one birthing partner, or if there's palliative care, um, family members, one family member is restricted for one hour at a time. This is to reduce the viral load on individuals that are visiting and to uh, promote the social distancing and protect um, our staff. Um, we have in the matter site um, worked very closely with um, families um, and we have uh, purchased a number of Wi-Fi, a number of, sorry, iPads, which with our Wi-Fi system, families can link to their loved one uh, at a distance. So whilst one member of the family can visit um, for no more than an hour, um, other members of the family can actually call in. Um, it, and we've just cleared that through charitable funds to purchase another um, number of iPads as we move into the city tower and other areas. I have to tell you the nursing staff in the matter have been exceptional. This has been driven by the frontline staff because they are committed to compassionate care. So I am being guided by them. We also can link through to chaplains in that way. And each individual nurse if a patient is on a palliative care pathway 
or passes away without someone at the bedside, the nurse caring for them is writing a personal card to that family within the next week to discuss um, how they passed away um, and their symptoms and anything they said in their final moments. Um, because this is not the way we would wish to deliver the care, but it is a new world. So we are doing all we can to connect through our Wi-Fi and our iPads. And we are not having a problem with our Wi-Fi at the moment in getting that through. Kathy, that's, um, that's really good to hear. And uh, I think your comments there just really drive home how serious an issue that this is and, um, and what incredibly difficult circumstances we are in. And we, we can only sit back in awe of, of what you guys are doing in terms of trying to look after each and every one of us and doing that sensitively at this time is is greatly appreciated. So I just wanted to finish with you by, by thanking you once again and I um, I'd appreciate it if you'd pass on certainly my thanks um to your colleagues this time. I, I will indeed and, and thank you very much. I will uh, Jerry Carroll uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Cathy, for your, for your presentation. I, I want to add as well concerns about PPE. Um, I'm still hearing reports about staff not having appropriate or enough uh, PPE. Um, you may or may not be aware, but the uh, Charter Society of Physiotherapists um, emailed myself, I'm assuming other members too, um, saying the staff have been highlighting this. They're delivering urgent respiratory care. They've highlighted the fact that they don't have enough um, uh, equipment and some of them have been threatened with disciplinary action. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but would it, would it be of concern to you, Cathy, that um, staff don't have enough equipment? And if they're raising uh, this as an issue, some of them are being issued with the um, uh, possibility of, of action against them. Uh, the other question is, are, is in relation to uh, ventilators uh, and ICU beds. Um, are you confident that we have enough ventilators and ICU beds uh, at the minute to deal with? Um, the worst case scenario of people with um, uh, COVID-19. I think it's 18% of the population has respiratory problems. So uh, would you be confident that we have enough um, ventilators and the ICU beds to deal with uh, um, people con uh, contracting COVID-19? So again, Jerry, thank you for those. They're really um, two questions and some of them have different parts. Um, I got the phys physiotherapist um, letter through Carol last night. I've asked for that to be looked at. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, this is something I take very seriously. Um, one of the big things and the most important thing that I do and my organization does is to ensure that staff are protected um, appropriately when they go in to face um, the front line and put their own health at, at risk because um, we need to make sure they have the most appropriate PPE. Uh, and I will do everything that I can to make sure that at all times staff have that. I take it really, um, I'm really shocked that anyone would threaten physiotherapists with disciplinary action um, regarding um, if they don't want to go in because they do not feel they have the appropriate PPE. That is not an organization that I recognize, and if you could contact me later, if it did happen in Belfast, I would be very keen to deal with that immediately um, and stop any recurrence of that at all. I think one of the challenges around the PPE guidance is that the Public Health England and Public Health Agency here have um, given the national guidance. Some of the Royal Colleges have given slightly different guidance, um, and I know the four CMOs um, in the different jurisdictions are meeting to try and rationalize this into a single cohesive guidance, because clearly this is very upsetting and it's very confusing uh, and it's very difficult for organizations to manage. Um, we have been tasked to manage the PPE guidance in line with PHE and PHA, um, but I do know that this is evolving and emerging. And I also understand that there is more guidance due out in the next 24, 48 hours, which may uh, change the guidance around some of the aerosol generating treatment. But physiotherapists are a member of staff that are on the front line with this aerosol generating. So I absolutely hear what you say, and I need to look into that and make sure that my staff are fully protected and should be protected.
at all times. And that's my commitment to you. Thank you if I have any more information. And just following up on the PPE, do, do you think staff are equipped uh, appropriately enough with the PPE at the minute? Um, I, I think we have enough at the moment. Um, my big challenge is three, four weeks ahead. You'll have seen the surge plan. It's projecting maybe a 20-week surge. Um, the supply chains are opening up. Uh, what I know the department are working on and what we have asked is that we, we would have a central store of perhaps 30,000 masks so that at any time our staff know that we have in our back pocket enough masks to keep them safe. And I think that's what would build the reassurance into the system. And that's why I was delighted when we got clearance that 30,000 masks would be coming to Belfast today. Because if we go into the regional Nightingale Hospital, the only thing that I can do is to make sure that I have enough oxygen, that my staff are protected, uh, and that I can actually support them in delivering the care they want to provide. So I just quickly on the ventilators, please. So on on the ventilators, um, I know that in the reasonable worst case scenario within Belfast, I have sufficient ventilators in Belfast to match that. You will know in the regional surge planning, the modelling that came out yesterday, there was different modelling. If you look at the reasonable worst case scenario, um, with the new ventilators that are coming, and I understand that's been confirmed, um, they should have enough capacity for the 118. However, in the modelling, you will also see that in the worst case scenario, if social distancing didn't work and we were facing maybe a thousand people needing ventilated, we do not have that number of ventilators in the system at the moment. So I have enough ventilators at the moment. I have enough ventilators in the um, reasonable worst case scenario modeling. But if we had the absolute worst case, we do not have that. And I know there are ventilators coming to Belfast because of the Nightingale model that we are now being asked to provide for the region. And that is 230 ventilated beds on the city hospital site. At the moment, Belfast doesn't have that, but I have assurance that those ventilators are coming for us to provide the care we need to. Uh, in terms of your last point, but I uh, appreciate your answers. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Jerry. Uh, or Leah. Sorry? I just wonder space to come in. I'm just indicating I'd like to come in at some point. Okay, no problem. I'll put your name on the list. So at the moment, I have Alan, uh, Paula, or Leah, and Colin. Uh, so. Alan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Kathy, I'd certainly like to be fully associated with the, uh, the remarks of the Chair, offering the support and the good wishes of this committee to you and your staff. Uh, my question uh, is around the, the Matter Hospital uh, a few weeks ago was announced as being uh, the Belfast Centre for patients who uh, had contracted uh, this virus. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering. Uh, is it the entire hospital that has been set aside for that function, or is it just a specialised part of it? And uh, then last night we had a statement issued that the city hospital uh, was now going to receive uh, those patients uh, as well. Uh, does that indicate that the Matter Hospital has reached capacity uh, for dealing with uh, infected patients, or, or is there still uh, some spare capacity in the matter? And in terms of the uh, city hospital, the statement did say that existing patients uh, in the hospital uh, were uh, being moved to other locations. Uh, can you give us an assurance uh, that moving such patients will not uh, compromise the, their well-being? Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks, Alan, for your good wishes. Uh, I think we need to be very clear about the local plans in Belfast and now the regional ask and the regional requirement. And can I just go back to the ventilators? So locally in Belfast, we do have enough ventilators for the modelling. But as we're asked to take on a regional role for a regional intensive care in the Nightingale, that's where the 230 ventilators come in. And that's where I'm saying that that, that is a step up 
And as the moment, we do not have those 230 on site today, but I have an assurance that they are coming. So I just, I just wanted to be clear in case my clumsy way didn't get those messages out there. So the matter is the local hospital for Belfast. It is not yet at capacity. We do have over 70 patients with COVID. Um, that hospital has in an entirety been given over to the management of patients with COVID symptoms. You are correct. Um, and our flows into the emergency department mirror that through ambulances. But what was announced last night is the regional requirement for a 230 bedded intensive care unit, which will not just be for the people of Belfast, but it is actually Belfast and beyond supplying the regional requirement for an intensive care. And the reason for that is that you can actually, by consolidating the really skilled expertise, safely manage greater numbers in one location. It was the same discussion regarding a potential field hospital. However, because the city hospital has good infrastructure and the oxygen supplies, the decision was taken regionally that that would be a better fit for us in Northern Ireland at the time. So they are different pieces of work, local plans versus regional plans. We have emptied the city tower block from levels one to nine. Uh, we have emptied some wards in the Royal because we are consolidating um, regional services. So our first, our very first phase in the surge plan was actually managing the small number of cases in our infectious diseases unit in the Royal Victoria Hospital up in 7A. Our second phase was planning for the matter as a COVID hospital. This is now our third phase and reflects the regional requirements. And so we have moved some low risk fracture patients out of the Royal Victoria Hospital. We have moved hepatobiliary out of the matter we have moved our large complex gynae surgery, our large complex um, colorectal upper GI all over to the Royal into those vascular wards where the low risk fractures have been moved up to Musgrave Park. These are unprecedented times. We are working to secure the flows of patients receiving cancer treatment in the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre and Bridgewater, so there's no transference. There may be some shift in some of the flows in cancer out to maybe the independent sector if we need to totally distance um, services. So we are working as a region to make sure that our key services continue for those most in need. And so for a region, we need to protect the regional um, specialist services like neurosurgery, vascular, cardiothoracic. We need to protect our trauma flows into the Royal, the surgery that can only happen there. Um, and yet we need to be ready and uh, prepared for those patients and the increasing number of COVID positive patients that are going to need acute medical beds and also uh, large numbers of intensive care unit beds. Thanks, Cathy. Stay safe. Thank you, Alan uh, Pollock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Paula Bradshaw. Do Dr. Jack. I just want to, to raise a couple of issues. The first one, I'm not sure you've necessarily got an answer to, but I do want to just make sure you're fully aware. Uh, as, as MLAs, we ha are receiving a number of correspondence from petrified staff members who maybe are single parents and have children at home who are very vulnerable with additional needs and are so scared to go into work in case they carry the infection home to their loved ones at home. When they raise these issues with their line managers, they are offered, in some instances, three days on paid carers' leave. And this is putting them in a really, really difficult position. So I just want to see if you have any comment on, on how they could possibly be accommodated. Um, the second question, and I, I appreciate your update then on, on can cancer treatments, is you know there's still a, a bit of 
confusion and lack of information out there in terms of the breast screening programmes and whether people should attend. And I did try to look on the um, Trust's website, and I think that there's maybe some information gaps there. So if that, if the patients themselves and the a website could be kept updated, that would be appreciated. Um, I'm not sure whether you, you were listening, but I asked the, the minister as to how many extra corporeal membrane oxygenators um, he has ordered, and he confirmed that he had none um, here in Northern Ireland, but that he had a pathway to use the Northern Ireland ambulance, or sorry, the air ambulance service to tra- ferry people to Northern Ireland. Are you concerned that when um, ventilation fails, and that obviously there's a time factor here, the patients in Northern Ireland may die if the, these ECMOs are not here in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Okay, Paula. Um, thank you, and please, please call me Cathy. Um, first of all, about the carers, um, we do have a number of staff that are. Um, single parents. Um, I mean, that's like any other um, organisation. Um, we are actively working with them to try and support them. We have a number now of child care, child care schemes. I think we're up to 130 places, and that's about to expand to 250, um, so that our key workers can come into work uh, and do the job they want to do but are also protected. We also have a number of staff who have vulnerable children at home who do not want necessarily to come back home. We are looking at accommodation. We have secured accommodation in some of our local hotels for them so that they can sleep safe. They get a warm meal and a good uh, breakfast. We have our local schools have been tremendous. Uh, and we have um, showers available through the schools like St Malahy's or Methodist College or St Mary's. Um, so those are our big sites. Uh, leisure centres through the Belfast City Council, they are looking at exploring that from our community workers. Uh, and we're also looking at a number of pods so that our staff feel that they can go home safely at night. We are running our summer schemes now within the trust ourselves, not only linking with the schools, so, and we are making sure that all our staff, when they come into work, have free car parking and can get meals in our canteen and any hot drinks that, that they need. Um, because actually, this the whole success will, this, will rest on how we care for our staff to care for the patients in need. So that's my number one priority, is caring for the staff so that they can care for others that need it. Um, You then raised the issue around screening programmes. That is an issue for the PHA. As you know, those are regional programmes that are managed through the Public Health Agency, not actually into the trust. We are continuing um, to run our assessment uh, programmes if the screening programme flags an issue uh, at this time. Uh, But I think the screening programmes really need to be directed to the Public Health agency regarding that service. And then lastly, you raise a very specific issue about ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This is a very, very specialist service, needs highly trained, skilled individuals um, that need to be skilled and also regularly undertaking it. So um, clearly um, these have not been ordered, but we have always been for Uh, And even over the swine flu, being able to access those very specialist centres in the UK. And I do know there are national uh, ethical guidance being developed to ensure there is fairness and equity um, for these scarce resources. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Orlea, do you want to come in now? Orlea Flynn? Um, Thanks. Thank you, Pat, and thanks very much, Um, Cathy. Just again, as a Belfast MLA, I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing. I know that Carl Lee Cullen um, has had a brilliant working relationship with you over the past couple of weeks, and and you've been really responsive to any issues that we've been bringing to your attention. So we're really, really appreciated as as locally elected reps. Um, But I really appreciate that too, eh? Because you hear different things that I might hear. 
So I think yeah. if that's happening, please, you know, um, I'm very receptive to hearing the voices and trying to address any of the issues concerned. And we'll be, you know, as you know, if there is issues with the supply chain, I will tell you, you know. Yeah, Cathy, that's brilliant. And that's great for us to hear also. We really appreciate it. Um, bringing it back just a wee bit to Paula's point that she had raised around the this sort of anxiety that's naturally creeping into staff around going into work, possibly contracting the virus and bringing it back to their families. We had raised in the first session there with Minister Swan um, around obviously the, the big elephant in the room at the minute. One of them is the impact, um, the lack of testing and the impact that, that this could be having on our health and social care staff. And I really just wanted to ask you, because I know obviously the uncertainty around the staff getting tested um, and, and the psychological impact that that's having on them, going home to their families and trying to carry out their duties, their life-saving duties and work. Um, have you any sort of idea of the impact that this is having in, in your staff within the Belfast Trust area? Um, have you a, a figure of how many currently are off sick? Um, and possibly, you know, obviously a, a portion of those people could be in work doing their duties if they were being tested. So have you any concerns that maybe your your, your staff in the Belfast Trust, um, that we're not getting that maximum amount of testing that the staff need um, in order to have them in work and to give them that, that reassurance and security that, that, you know, they're safe to go home to their family. So that's just the first wee question around the, the, the testing um, oh, the second one, yeah. again, that I raised with the Minister was in and around the issue, then the more broad issue around mental health um, on the workforce. Um, Knight Robbins wanted to just say there earlier that there is work underway and that support will be there for staff at need. So, again, I would just be interested to just hear your views on that. And, again, if there's anything that we can do to help to work with the Minister to make sure that we are getting them, um, them provisions in place to help the staff over the next couple of weeks and months. And then just finally, if you don't mind, it was a query that was brought to my attention from some district nurses um, who are working out in the, some of the community centres. And what they were saying was that um, if they, once they have been in contact with a, a patient that's been tested positive with COVID-19, um, it's something as simple as, as are they expected to, you know, go back into their own cars, travel home, in, in their uniform that may possibly be contaminate, con, contaminated, um, you know, and then, you know, might have a scenario that their children are getting into that same car maybe later on that afternoon, that evening or the next day. And the other thing was around, you have mentioned briefly around, see the, the shower facilities within the trust premises. Um, are you content that um, the district nurses and other staff that are working with COVID-19 patients that they have access um, to the Sharn facilities. So I suppose so they're not contaminating, um, you know, the whole of the building, but it's sort of, you know, that there's measures in place that if they are working with a patient, um, that they can get the shower or get their uniforms washed. Just practical things like that. I think there's some weak concerns out there um, at the minute. So I know that was a lot of gave you there, Cathy. Thank you. Not at all. I, I, there's three elements there. If, if I've heard right, the testing, the mental health, and then the district nurses and how they yep. protect their families. Um, so uh, regarding regarding the testing, uh, at the moment, um, and this is yesterday's figures, uh, I have 1,200 staff that are um, self-isolating because of a family member that's um, symptomatic. Um, mm -hmm. And I have 791 staff yesterday um, that are self-isolating because they are symptomatic. So that's um, just under, um, you know, 2,000 staff, uh, and that's nearly 10% of my workforce. Um, so clearly, if you are symptomatic with a high fever, um, you, prob you wouldn't want those staff at work anyway, because e if they have COVID, certainly not. If they don't have COVID, they may have something else that's infectious. So we are really looking at how can we test the 1,200 that actually feel well, but have a family member or a close contact that um, are displaying symptoms. The big challenge is whilst our laboratory staff have worked um, you know, uh, outstandingly and stepped forward and the number of tests that we can do, the capacity in the lab has increased from 40 up to nearly 900 or 1,000 a day. We do have an issue with the reagents and the rush 
supply chain. Um, so whilst we're doing the tests, we have machines that can do the tests, but they rely on reagents that come from outside Northern Ireland to undertake these tests. Um, so at the moment, um, with the amount of reagents that we are getting, our, our limit is 300 tests a day. Um, now, I know the department is looking at this. They are looking at the universities. They're looking at the Department of Agriculture. They have a regional group looking at can we do different tests to upscale that to the level that we need, and can we open up the supply chain of the reagents, the sort of liquid that we need to run the test on, to get back to the capacity that we currently have in our lab. Um, so, yes, I would like to see... Um, the majority of those 1,200 staff, if they don't have COVID, coming back to work. That means that we would be testing family members um, and close contacts. The second thing about mental health, we have a clinical psychology service. Um, uh, Sarah Meakin is running a team within the organization uh, to look at how do we support our staff right across our organization in managing our own mental health at this time. I mean, I've told you about um, some of the issues that our nursing PCSS staff um, are having to grapple with in the matter. I've, I've asked them about their personal experiences, um, what, you know, in, in this palliative phase that people move into, you know, is is it and for want of a, is it a, a good death? Do patients struggle? How are they managing their own mental health? They have a safety huddle every morning when they come in to talk about here are our stores. This is our challenges today. Is everybody okay? They have a touch out. They are taking time at the end of a shift to take time out just to check in with the mental health. We have a Be Well app, our Oki Health team are looking at how we can support and I know there is a regional piece of work now looking at the mental health of our workforce. We've had a number of um, retired psychology staff and psychiatric staff coming back with offers of help so that they can actually help support staff. We have um, short rounds and balance groups that we already do. We're now looking at how we, and that's about how do staff feel when they come into work, you know, how do they feel uh, at the moment in the situation that they find themselves? So it is an opportunity to, for staff in a safe space to talk about their feelings. We are linking them through our Teams, which is um, a Microsoft platform where people can be socially distanced, but yet have a safe space to talk about the challenges that they find themselves in, which is completely different to the world that we would normally work in. Um, so this is all um, extremely difficult. And then lastly, your issue about district nursing. And I absolutely hear that. We are looking at guidance about how to clean cars. We want staff to come in. We want them to come in in their own clothes, be able to change into scrubs, um, work in scrubs with appropriate PPE, finish the job, go in, shower, uh, put their scrubs into a laundry, knowing that they'll be sufficient to pick up the next day, change into their normal clothes, clean their car, and then go safely home. Because this, I cannot stress enough, my job and the job of all the management in Belfast Trust is to support staff to do the job they need to do and to protect them while doing it. Brilliant, Kathy. Thank you very much. And, and we are looking at the, the leisure centres and pods for showers and anything else if we need to do. And if they don't feel safe going home, then actually look, linking with local hoteliers, getting them a nice warm bed, clean sheet and a good meal and a good breakfast to go in the morning to face the challenge of the day ahead. Thank you, Thank you Kathleen. Thank you, Arlia. Uh, I want to bring Colin McGrath in now. Colin, do you want to take this seat? Well, can we just check, Cathy, can you hear me from here? Or uh, Yes, I, I can hear a little bit faint, so excuse oh. me, or 
uh, if I ask you to repeat anything, but I, ca I can hear you. That's okay, I've come a bit closer to a microphone that works. So, um, oh, much better. Yes, uh, and I appreciate you've answered lots of questions at this stage. It must be difficult to, to be under such um, intense pressure to give detailed answers. So, thank you very much for the responses to date. Um, could, could I ask you just for your view, though, on um, testing, insofar as we really only seem to be this week deciding that testing is something that we should be increasing and something that we should be doing more of, although we're a good probably six weeks in um, to this, this pandemic um, in, in the north. So d do you feel that we've missed something by not doing the testing to this stage and suddenly now deciding that it is something that we should do? Um, can I ask in a separate question what your um, connections are with the private sector on the ground? Because obviously private care homes, private residential homes, private nursing homes um, are clambering to get the same stock that you uh, within the National Health Service are trying to get to as well. Um, and do you have any way of checking if there is a scarcity on the ground and if a private residential care home wasn't able to have the right level of stock, would it be able to contact yourselves to be able to get some of that stock? And then the final question is, there's um, figures being released today, I understand the show, that, that so far there's been a 20% rise in domestic violence figures, um, which is obviously shocking. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, as the trust, you would probably work in partnership with a number of domestic violence organisations. And I was just wondering if that was a key responsibility for somebody to ensure that any of the appropriate services that need to be on the ground aren't prevented uh, as a result of the coronavirus outbreak, and that every service that is required for those that may be suffering from um, domestic violence is handed out to them. Thank you. Okay, so ag again, Colin, I think there's um, three key areas you want me to cover. First of all, regarding testing, we continue to do the best uh, with the resources we have. I absolutely um, acknowledge that we need to test the patients that come in under our care, both to make sure that we manage them optimally, but also to protect our staff at all times. Secondly, I do think the key workers that need to be tested are those delivering essential services, such as our health and social care staff, and that would include um, members from the independent sector. Um, so um, we are working on extending that with the region and with our other agencies. Um, obviously, I'm not responsible for the regional procurement. Um, so we would be linking with our sister organizations through Silver to raise that. Um, and I know that work is ongoing at a regional level linking with any private provider, universities, other departments um, within, the loop, within government to try and get the resources that we require to extend the testing. The second point you raised about private residential care independent sector, um, we have a number of clients in those institutions. We have a clear designated distribution point. We have a named member of our staff that is responsible for dis distributing um, PPE to those organizations. And whilst I'll acknowledge those organizations normally would be responsible for sourcing their own PPE, it is very clear that if they don't have available sources, they come to local trusts and they will be provided with that. And Belfast has to date always matched that. We have provided that to date. We have very good working relationships with our local nursing, residential, and even local hospices. Uh, and we have provided those PPE to them um, that have been required and will continue to do so. Um, and so that is part of our central distribution point. Um, so we have done that. We will continue to do that. And we have a stock for that. So I can give you some reassurance on that. And then regarding um, the domestic violence, we have, um, and I have to check this, we have not seen an increasing number as far as I sit here today. It hasn't been flagged to me coming through our local EDs. We obviously have clear schemes for our own staff if they have any issues, but we would, of course, not stand down any of our um, work with sister organizations across Belfast uh, regarding domestic abuse or mental health and physical well-being um, in 
the home or within that. So that is something that we continue to do. And um, while we may not be the league organization for that, we certainly have our staff on the ground linking with those that we need to link with to ensure that we can provide whatever help we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Colin. Um, Cathy, this is uh, Pat Sheehan, the acting chair, just coming back in again. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions around the virology lab and the processes that take place in relation to testing. And I also wanted to ask you about the uh, mortuary services. Um, so first of all, just on, on the virology lab and the testing that takes place there, and I, I understand that's the only place where testing for COVID-19 is taking place at the minute, is that right? No, that's no longer the case. Initially it was, Pat, but now there is um, COVID testing in the Northern Trust that is currently um, available, and I, I also think there is some in the Southern Trust. If it's not available, it's due to come online in the near future. So there's two other trusts now that test. Okay. Uh, and I just, I'm just wondering, could you walk me through the process of, of, of what actually happens? Uh, my understanding is that there is a testing kit uh, uh, and swabs are taken off uh, uh, someone who is suspected of having an infection. What, what then happens after that? Okay, so um, I visited the virology lab, I think it was a, a fortnight ago, to have a look at their systems and processes and just meet the staff. So um, I, I am not a virology expert, so forgive me if I get this wrong. They have, they have separated um, their um, sampling collection points. So there are swabs taken, as you know, from the throat and the nose of individuals. They are then um, triple bagged or boxed to make sure they are marked separately uh, and um, very secure. They then are coming in and there is a separate um, reception centre for these COVID positive um, or suspected specimens. They are then inactivated. So the first thing is they are inactivated so that the staff in the lab would not be put at risk as they process the samples. It's based, I, uh, my understanding is on RNA um, and, uh, and then replicating it up at scale to get, so there is a number of steps in the the process so they inactivate it they clean it they multiply it and then they can come out um showing that they, that the test is positive or not and there's small number of tests that need to be checked again if the result is borderline and um, we now have three different machines doing that which means we do have some resilience in the system uh, and that's why we have our own machine that will every day deliver 150, but the other machine then rests on a rush supply of kit that comes from elsewhere. Now that's like, so when you put the sample in, you have to put it in a medium. So that would be the fluid in the medium that would grow the inactive um, RNA up so that you could test it on the machine. And it's that medium that we are struggling to get the supply chain in and the whole process takes about four and a half hours from the time it arrives in the lab to being verified by a consultant virologist um, and these are all formally accredited tests so we know when we give a positive that we can stand over that result so i hope that makes sense and um, yeah. it's it's yeah. probably my my clumsy way of describing it and if you'd like a briefing i'm sure connell um my, our consultant connell mccacky who is absolutely superb in this would be happy to talk you through the detailed process but this is just my sort of yeah. layman's um view of what happens in the lab yeah and uh, i i understand that kathy and thanks for that and i suppose um like colin uh, said earlier in his question, I mean, there's some surprise that the level of testing hasn't increased substantially over the past number of weeks, given the warnings we were getting from China as far back as early January. Uh, and I, I understand there appears to be a problem with the reagent 
that's used, the medium that's used to test the samples. Uh, although I did notice that uh, a journalist tweeted out the other night that he had spoken to the, the chemical industries in England and, and they said the only reason there was a shortage was because this reagent hadn't been ordered or asked for. But I suppose that's, that's by the by. We, we understand now that, that it's creating a pinch point in the system. But are there any other areas where there are difficulties or obstacles? Are there enough testing kits and so on? Are there enough staff trained? Is the virology uh, laboratory big enough to cater with the, the demand if there were sufficient testing kits and reagents and so on? So the capacity within the lab to do the test has increased considerably, as you know, and we're right up to um, a thousand a day. And, and just for your information, we did 514 on the 31st of March, because this is yesterday's data that I would get, and a total of 86 were positive. So um, that shows you the level that we are working at. Our rate limiting capacity within the lab is not the manpower or the equipment. It is the reagent that comes from Roche. Um, and the second thing you asked about were the testing kits. The testing kits, which are the swabs, we have sufficient number of those. We have two pods currently that work outside the Royal and just off the um, Crumlin Road. Um, we take up to 120 um, a day um, for tests. And that we open up for our, our staff um, to be tested or because it, the patients are being tested as they come in to our ED or staff from other hospitals or NIAS, et cetera, coming through. So we have the ability to test 120. I know there are there is work, and I saw it in the news yesterday, about work looking at increasing testing and using different um, different uh, sites um, across Belfast, looking at how you, um, we can increase the level of testing. I also know that NIBTS is looking at how they come online to double the testing capacity. And then from the regional calls in Silver, I know that the universities um, are looking at that um, and how we have worked looking at how we train some of their staff up and also the Department of Agriculture. Um, so, Dara, so I know there is a lot of work going on in that area about scaling up further, but the rate limiting step for us today is, as you said, Pat, the reagent at the moment. Okay, okay thanks for that. And, and just in terms of the, the mortuary services uh, in the Belfast Trust, and specifically, I suppose, in the Royal, um, my understanding is that there's very small staff uh, within the mortuary services, and I'm wondering what restrictions have been put in place in terms of uh, situation when someone has died as a result of this coronavirus. Uh, what processes are put in place in terms of how the remains are handled after death? So, so. Um, there has been guidance just released um, yesterday um, regarding the um, care of the deceased um, and how we can make sure that um, there is no onward transmission after death because this is something that individuals are not sure of. Um, so um, there is detailed uh, instruction around how we um, secure the body, how it's in a secure bag, uh, and then how that itself is secured and zipped. And, and you are right, we have limited capacity in the RBH mortuary at the moment. Um, we are meeting the demand. I know then, like in phase one and phase two, of preparing for ill patients. Um, there is work ongoing at a regional level for a phase two, where we'd be using the um, regional forensic um, coroner's service and then on yeah, to the then work. Sorry. Has left the conference. Sorry. Sorry. 
Yes, yes. Sorry, I am. that was so. Uh, and then um, I heard the Justice Minister then talking about the decision regarding the um, sort of failed mortuary. So there are three waves in this. But as I sit here today, our current RVH mortuary is able to meet the current demands. Um, but there are very detailed instructions out to our hospital staff, but also to local undertakers regarding the care of the deceased. Um, and as you know, it's really difficult for everybody. Yeah, and, it is and really difficult. I, I take from what you're saying then that the relatives will not be able to view the deceased, uh, uh, the, the, their own relatives after death. The body yeah. um, has been placed in, in the bag and then the external yeah, bag as well. There are several bags used to make sure there's... Um, uh, there can be no onward transmission, uh, and you know that 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 is heartbreaking as well as many things that we face now because it's just not the way you know Northern Ireland works. It's just not it's not what we do here. Okay, that's that's all the questions I have. Uh, if, uh, yes, Colm. I could get in there if Chappie has another minute. Yes, Colm. Chappie, I suppose with, first of all, the first thing I want just is to flag up one issue. It's not directly related to yourself and then of a question, but just, just to flag up that the committee will be discussing later correspondence that we are engaged in with the uh, with the department around other vulnerable groups and in particular motor neuron disease. I just want to flag up that there may be groups who are particularly vulnerable here who haven't yet been identified and that may increase the pressure on services, particularly in Belfast Trust. So I, I wanted to flag that to you. Um, there is also... Uh, there's been there's been documentation lately t that says that there will be the uh, trust will be interpreting flexibly. This is to do with nursing homes and residential settings and discharges from hospital into those. That the trust will be interpreting flexibly the requirements around reviews and assessments, including the regulatory standards. And my questions in relation to that, Kathy, would be first of all, what discussions you've had with the RQIA and trusts in relation to those standards. And the second, a second angle on that is, what support are you putting in to the care home sector in terms of ensuring that they have proper guidance on how to treat and look after people who are discharged to protect them and to protect people who don't have corona, uh, COVID-19? And also, in practical terms, what are you doing to support that sector in terms of uh, oxygen, in terms of medicines, including anticipatory medicines? And including and, and also the wider range of PPE concerns, which we all are, are aware of. Thank you. Okay, Colm. So um, the first thing about the vulnerable groups, including motor neuron, I I know that through um, the electoral registers and also the GPs, the number of vulnerable um, individuals are being identified, and the PHA and the region are identifying through a heat map um, the vulnerable individuals across the different localities. And I have, joined the conference. I, I have seen um, some of the basic maps, and we would hope uh, once, the, once the information governing the conference has been cleared with the CMO that we will get right down to a level of detail that will help us safely manage those most at risk within the Belfast locality. So there's been a huge amount of work in that area. Um, and and I would like to, you know, if we can get the access to that information, I think that would really help our community teams um, and the volunteers that are really coming on board now to ensure that in a time of social isolation, that we are a connected community right across um, the city. The, the second thing about the trust, the nursing homes and the residential homes, there has been a change in RQIA and RQIA wrote out regarding their role in regulation of nursing and residential homes and how they are freeing up their staff to go in and support the nursing homes in, in this time. As you know, we have a named contact for our nursing homes um, that would advise on the appropriate use of PPE, make sure the PPE is there and look at the other requirements. I don't know specifically about the oxygen, 
because that is usually through community pharmacists, but I will pick that up column and take that um, back. We are also looking at how we use our acute care at home team to support our GP colleagues and manage those uh, individuals who live in nursing homes, that's part of their normal home, uh, and how we can manage them better uh, and how, if they get ill, can we support them in that environment to a much better degree than perhaps we have done historically. So there is a lot of work going on in that area. And on the heat map, it actually shows you all our nursing homes and residential homes and the number of individuals that are within that uh, home so that we can look and see where the risks are. And I also have a my sit rep uh, that I get. I have um, across our community services Again, the number of positive cases, the number suspected, the staffing um, issues all flagged uh, and any challenges um, through our daily sit rep. So I don't just have a hospital sit rep in Belfast. I have a community sit rep for the adults and I have a children's community sit rep coming online so that I can see the entirety of the services that we're responsible for um, because patients and clients in these nursing homes are still our responsibility. And I will do all I can to make sure that they are well looked after and that the staff looking after them, whether they're in independent sector or statutory homes are also provided for and looked after. Okay. And if I could maybe just ask you a hypothetical, and I know it's not a hypothetical situation by any means, but if, if you could focus on one thing and one thing only to help you do your job with tackling this disease, what would that be of one thing? For me, it is ensuring that I have the confidence of the staff and that I support them to do the job they need to do. So that is about making sure that, that the anxiety of the staff regarding the PPE has been addressed, that we have in our stockpile you know, a bank so that they know they're going to be safe at all times and that I can provide the small comforts. If you look at Maslow's Triangle of Human Need, to make sure that they feel psychologically safe uh, as they come in to do the work. I think that is where I'd focus. And then the second thing would be, because you asked me one, so I'm going to ask for a second if I can yeah, on the wish list, would be that we could test the families um, and the key workers to ensure that we would have um, enough staff at work if they, if they can be at work at this time as we face into the surge. And actually, you know, these are unknown and uncharted waters we're looking into. Um, and if I could, thirdly, if I could connect our staff right across and continue to tell them how fabulous they all are, um, you know, uh, and make sure that the small comforts are being addressed. Um, you, know, uh, you know, that's my wish list of three things. Thank, thank you very much, Cathy. And I have to say, I think it's incumbent on all of us who are involved in this that we deliver on those on those three requests that you have, um, and that that the, the that those those tools are put into the hands of you and frontline healthcare staff who are out there doing all they can and who will be severely challenged in the time ahead. I just want to end my own remarks with with reiterating my thanks to you and your staff for the way you've engaged with reps across the board. That has been hugely helpful, and I know you've acknowledged that as well. And just to wish you and your entire staff all the best over the, over the weeks and and possibly months to come. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you. And can I just say, public support has been overwhelming, uh, and every single one of us um, are touched and humbled by the way. So in, in this time of social isolation, I've seen communities come together like never before and the partnership working um, across all the sectors and, you know, come with the MLAs and that, this is exactly what we need to get through this. Um, so can I also reiterate your thanks back to that of the health committee uh, and everybody in the room and to all your partners uh, and your contacts can I just say you're doing a fabulous job too, so thank you. And keep keep coming in, keep coming in with the queries, because actually that's very helpful to us all. And we'll take them away and we'll get back to you as soon as we can and we'll address them, because actually only by working together can we get through this. So thank you again.
very much for that, Cathy. Thanks for your time. Uh, and needless to say, you have uh, the best wishes of this committee from all of us uh, in the days, weeks, uh, and months ahead. Uh, and just to reiterate the commendation I gave to all your staff, uh, not just in the Belfast Trust, but in all the trusts, all those who are in the front line putting themselves at risk. So thank you, uh, and thanks to everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. So, I just say, take care and, and keep safe, uh, and thanks again. Thank you. Um, uh, members, um, we have to be out of here for for one thirty because the Justice Committee are meeting here at 2, and the room needs to be cleaned beforehand. Our, our next witness, Nigel McMahon, or McMahon uh, is on the line, but I'm proposing we take a quick comfort break for five minutes. Uh, it's 5-2 now. Back here for one. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly... Thanks very much, members. Uh, we'll reconvene the meeting. We're on to item seven, uh, SR 2020-55, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2020. Uh, I refer members to the papers at tabs 7.1 to 7.5. Uh, this statutory rule has been made by the Department in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Department advises that due to the urgency of the situation, there was no time to prepare an SL1 policy proposal. However, a departmental official is present today via telephone to brief us uh, and answer questions. May I welcome Nigel McMahon. Is it McMahon or McMahon, Nigel? McMahon. Department of Health, uh, uh, and invite you, Nigel, to uh, brief the members. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, by way of introduction, uh, just to sort of set the scene, I guess, um, Clause 48 and Schedule 18 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 made um, new provisions for powers to deal with public health in Northern Ireland. Schedule 18 um, inserted new provisions um, known as Part 1A into the Public Health Act, Northern Ireland, 1967. And it provides um, a power for the department to make regulations to allow for measures to be introduced to help delay or prevent the further transmission of coronavirus disease. So the coronavirus restrictions regulations um, were made under this amended 1967 Act. The regulations were made under the emergency procedure set out in Section 25Q of the 1967 Act. The Department was of the opinion that uh, by reason of urgency it was necessary to make the regulations without the draft having been laid and approved so that these public health measures could be taken in response to the serious and imminent threat to public health um, posed by the incidence and spread of coronavirus. The regulations came into force at 11 p.m. on Saturday last, the 28th of March, 2020, and they were published on the department's website soon after. The regulations will cease to have effect in 28 days, beginning on the 28th of March, unless the regulations are approved by the Assembly. The regulations themselves require the department to review the need for the restrictions and requirements imposed by the regulations at least every 21 days, with the first review being carried out by the 18th of April 2020. The restrictions uh, and requirements imposed by the regulations will end at a time and date specified in a direction to be published by the department, and the regulations in any case will cease to have effect after a period of six months. To summarise, um, the requirements of the regulations relate to three main areas, the closure of businesses, the movement of people and public gatherings. The regulations require businesses selling food or drink for consumption on the premises and businesses listed in part two of schedule two, except for limited permitted uses to close. Businesses offering goods for sale or hire that are listed in part three of schedule two are permitted to remain open. The regulations also prohibit anyone leaving the place where they live without reasonable excuse. Examples of a reasonable excuse are specified
provide in the regulations, such as the need to provide care or assistance to a vulnerable person, to travel for purposes of work, and to access critical public services. The third part of the regulations ban public gatherings of more than two people. I'm quite happy to go into more detail in terms of the specific requirements of each of the regulations, if that would be helpful to the committee and to take any, any uh, questions or comments the committee may have. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Nigel, um, Colin, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, well, um, I suppose one, one of the things, on, on the 1st of March, it was agreed that our committee meeting on the 12th of March agreed that we would write to the department asking them to include information as to how this relates. We, we always get information on how it relates to England, Scotland, Wales, but we had asked that it relates to how it relates to the position in the South. So I think that's particularly important, given that Ireland is recognised as one epidemiological unit, and therefore any measures that we're taking should have, should be, to the greatest degree possible, harmonised north and south. And I think it's welcome, albeit belated, that there is a memorandum of understanding being signed between the CMOs north and south. So the messaging and the, the tactics and the strategies can be, can be kept in as close harmony as they can. So the committee, the committee had agreed to request that in the future the department should include in the information it provides to the committee on all proposed statutory rules the position in the Republic of Ireland and in relation to equivalent legislation, if appropriate. So, Nigel, I would ask there what, what has been done in relation to that aspect. Thanks, Chair. Um, obviously, this is a very fast-moving situation. Um, in terms of these particular regulations, uh, even more so than many of the other measures, um, we think had approximately two days um, after, after very, very little notice um, that England planned to introduce uh, the regulations, that we should follow suit and do this. Um, and clearly, uh, there, was a, there was a strong push there in terms of uh, having a consistent um, uh, approach in terms of providing an equivalent legislative platform across um, the four countries of the UK uh, to do this quickly, follow the, following the Prime Minister's announcement about the measures that we were being brought in. Um, I'm aware, obviously, that measures have been introduced uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I have to say, and apologies for the fact that I wasn't uh, aware that um, uh, the department was re was required to include this in, in um, briefings for this. So I'm afraid I haven't uh, don't have an analysis to hand on the comparison between um, uh, the, the, the changes. Oh, sorry, the restrictions, which of course um, have changed even in recent days. But um, if, if the committee would like to request that, I'm sure we could we could uh, have a look at that and come back. Yeah, well, the committee have already have already agreed to request that, and I think it's particularly important in light of the very integrated social and business and, and systems that we have, have you know health cooperation that, that these issues are considered so they don't create barriers or blockages or problems to dealing with this crisis or any other issue. Thank you. That's me, Pat. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pam, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nigel, for your attendance here today. Um, and obviously, um, the content of this SR is unprecedented, but justified in light of the public health crisis. And, um, and um, you know, I think we should, as a committee, absolutely, we need to support um, the. The, the measures in this SR um, subject to this review every three weeks. But in terms of um, uh, essential services, is the Department and Trust feeding into the debate around essential manufacturing in order to ensure that important parts of supply of medical in particular and associated supplies are not um, closed or disrupted? Thank you. Um as you can imagine, with uh, any type of regulations that try and um, produce lists, I suppose, lists of businesses that should open, should close, there are many businesses that are not included on, on either list. Um, for the most part, um, the Schedule uh, 3, which is all the businesses that should close, are effectively um, uh, retail-type premises um, and do not include any, any type of, of um, manufacturing as things stand uh, at the moment. 
So in that sense, the regulations do not prohibit um, uh, any type of manufacturing to, to continue and to proceed. Obviously, advice then comes from public health agency in terms of social distancing measures that should be uh, required and implemented in those workplaces uh, to, to keep operations going. And of course, the health and safety uh, executive advise in terms of uh, the health and safety of staff and so on. So in broad terms, uh, there's no differentiation at this point in time between uh, manufacturers who are supporting um, the, the health effort and, and, um, and those that are not. Uh, they simply have to, to uh, give cognizance to the requirements to keep their staff safe and to be in a position to put measures in place within their workplaces that, that allow them to keep open and to keep manufacturing. Yeah, so we're really relying on, uh, you know, good responsibility measures from a lot of companies to ensure both that we have the vital supplies that we need and that a, you know, a firm that doesn't need to actually be open does, in fact, close uh, in order to help us in, in terms of fighting this epidemic. Um, I, I do understand that. And the other question I'd ask you, Nigel, was around um, kind of enforcement issues. And I, mean, I mentioned earlier when we were speaking to um, the trust about hospital visiting and such. And I've been made aware just this morning, actually, through a, a tweet um, about uh, the prominent DJ tweeting that he had been contacted by somebody who was looking for a DJ for a house party for the weekend for 30 to 40 people. And Obviously, that's completely inappropriate and ridiculous, but we're led to believe that this is not actually unusual. Is there anything there in, in that regulation that will help to uh, help even the PSNI to enforce or ensure that they can act on if they do here of incidents such as house parties going on where there are large gatherings of people? within people's homes? Is this something that uh, can be acted on through this legislation? Well, uh, in terms of the powers available to the police at this point in time, uh, they have powers to be able to direct people to disperse. They have power mm -hmm. to uh, direct people to return back to the place where they live um, and, in fact, to, to intervene to make sure that's the case should they choose to, to do that. Um, they also have the option of issuing um, fixed penalty notices if the person is over 18 that would initially be a fixed penalty of 60 pounds um, which reduces to 30 pounds if it's paid within 14 days but if the person's already received a fixed penalty before then the uh, the amount of the second fixed penalty for that person is 120 pounds and it doubles on each repeat offense up to a maximum of 960 pounds and there's no discount then for a subsequent um, offense um, as with the other um, uh, uh, um, offences in the uh, legislation, there's also the potential for a fine for uh, anybody up the, on conviction up to £5,000, and that does apply to anybody, including a person who's under 18. Um, so there are some options there. You would like to think that people would comply with, with the first range of those um, enforcement options, which is... a um, uh, complying with the direction to disperse or to return home. But um, I've no doubt that the police will, will uh, consider the other options available to them if that's not the case. Okay, that's confident. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. I'm just wondering about the um, communication of these regulations out to the public. I represent South Belfast, and as you know, there'll be a lot of um, different communities there speaking different languages and I'm conscious that there are gaps maybe in terms of the um, information getting to them. So whose responsibility is it to um, communicate and make sure that the, there's information in the form of leaflets, for example, circulated into communities where there is a concentration of people speaking um, different languages? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Philan. That, that, that's a fair point. Um, Again, with the, the, the pace of development and publication of these, uh, we're clearly, to some extent, playing a little bit of catch-up in terms of providing information after the, the event. It was important, um, particularly over the weekend, that the regulations were in place um, so that um, businesses uh, had some sort of clarity on, on, on 
month, the following Monday morning about where they stood in all of this. But you make a very important point about communication to the public. Regulations are, in my experience, really, well, they're very unusual in every respect, but they're, they're particularly unusual, it seems to me, because um, they, they clearly relate to public health measures. They're made under um, Department of Health, public health powers, which is, seems very appropriate under the circumstance. But in a sense, they're, they're also very cross-cutting in that the measures within them um, relate to the responsibilities of a range of other departments, you know, not least Department of Economy and Businesses, um, Justice uh, Communities and the Executive Office. Um, so the cross-departmental work on that um, it ta takes, takes a little bit of doing. And the Executive Office have been uh, extremely helpful in that regard with coordinating some of that thought and work and indeed um, have made some, some initial, done some initial work around um, uh, guidance on this. Um, I think it's certainly an important point that I'm quite happy to, to take back in that regard and feed in that we need to be, be thinking about uh, communities, uh, other ethnic communities out there and uh, communication in different languages. Thank you. Appreciate that. OK, Paul, thank you. Uh, Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nigel. I mean, obviously, these, these powers are quite wide ranging and necessary in most cases. And I think there still is a concern amongst people that there's been a, a slowness to act from um, from the department and the executive generally around around this crisis. And you know, Boris Johnson's approach has followed for too long. But um, in terms of this, the, these powers, I mean, my my concern is that people are being told to socially distance and self isolate. But there's non-essential businesses that are, that are still open, with people obviously working in them, and a lot of them, of which don't have any or enough uh, PPE um, or sort of rig rigorous um, uh, social distancing policies uh, in place. So, is there a sense that there's going to be more done to try and um, force places that shouldn't be open to to close down with these with these powers? Um. Well, two, two things, I suppose, occurred to me to me on that. The first was going back to the answer to a previous question, I suppose, whereas, you know, there there always has been and, and, and always will be, I guess, um, an onus on um, the owners of businesses who are remaining open to look after the health and well-being um, of their staff. And, and most, uh, if not all, should be well aware of their responsibilities and um, in that regard. And this is just another, I suppose, area of risk that they need to consider if they're going to continue their business and they have to act responsibly, take advice from the PHA and health and safety executive and put various measures in place. And if they can do that for the most part, um, shift patterns, reducing numbers of staff, that sort of thing, um, then many may well be able to continue to operate. And in fact, you know, that that's probably a good thing all round um, for, for the economy and for, for staff and employers alike. Um, no doubt there will be circumstances where there are questions about that and there are of course avenues open to raise that you know health and safety is um, um the health and safety responsibility is a slightly tricky one in that the responsibility for enforcement under the legislation is split between health and safety executive and the environmental health departments of district councils depending on what type of business it is but those two uh, groups of organisations are well used to providing this advice to employers and indeed taking uh, complaints and dealing with those from staff as well. Whilst um, the volume of those sorts of queries may have risen as a result of these regulations, uh, that should be the route um, um, for that. Um, it, it, with the news, I think it was yesterday or the day before, but the health and safety executive aren't uh, visiting employers, obviously, at this current time. So I think, I think there's a concern that um, people are raising these issues, but workplaces are still remaining open with, yeah. either, with either no social distancing or no PPE or certainly not uh, um, inadequate levels of that. So if that's the case, what do people do? Yeah. Well, in the first instance, I think you know those queries and complaints should still be directed to uh, to HSE or to Environmental Health and District Council. The this conference has been running for a long duration. Please press star one to continue with this conference. Otherwise, your conference will be disconnected in one. Minute. Thank you. Your conference will now carry on. Okay. Thanks. Um. um Sorry, trying to remember where, where I was now. Yes, uh, so, so, so those queries should come through. Obviously, 
HSE and the councils are actively considering, you know, the, their enforcement position. The other element of this, um, you may have noticed in the regulations, is that as things stand, it's really only the police who are designated, you know, in terms of um, enforcement action around this. But there is the option for the department to designate uh, others. And I would just say that in terms of, of that, that sort of under active discussion as things stand at the moment as to um, whether it would be appropriate uh, to designate others to assist with the enforcement and to some extent that inf that decision will be influenced by what we're seeing on the ground and the feedback we're getting about how compliant businesses are. Okay. Alan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Nigel, uh, I understand that the uh, uh, international passenger flights coming into Belfast International Airport have ceased, uh, but there is still a, a number, a very welcome number, of cargo flights uh, coming into the international airport, uh, obviously from international destinations. Is there any potential for any of these uh, cargos uh, posing any threat to staff? who would be involved uh, in unloading them and distrib distributing them? And also, are there any checks uh, on the health uh, been made of, of, say, crews uh, who may be uh, bringing those flights in and disembarking uh, at the airport? And also, uh, I, I'm very aware that the, the first case of, of virus uh, 19 uh, in, in Northern Ireland was uh, carried in uh, by someone arriving uh, from a flight that had landed at Dublin Airport uh, from Italy. Um, if you are uh, corresponding with the authorities in the Republic of Ireland uh, and collecting data, could you also request uh, uh, what um, checks are, are in place at the airport currently to check on the health of both crew and passengers arriving there uh, from international destinations? And could you also uh, establish uh, when these measures uh, were actually introduced at Dublin Airport? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, certainly, take the last the last point away um, and, and check check that for you. Um, in terms of uh, crew handling goods and so on and so forth, um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything specific. I have to say, uh, in more in broader terms, I would say that um, it's probably not that much different from any other form of work in the sense that um, the employers at the airport for for um, staff and crew are required under the health and safety legislation to do a risk assessment of all risks in the workplace um, and should be looking at that if they consider it to be a risk in terms of the types um, of goods that are being handled and how staff are actually operating together. Again, back to following the advice around social distancing for, for their staff and any other people that may be, may be on site. Um, so it should really, like any other work activity, be risk assessed in the light of uh, COVID-19 as a new risk and measures put in place to allow that to uh, to continue safely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Nigel, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, and members, before we discuss our approach, uh, I would remind members of the normal approach to cross-cutting matters of this nature. Circumstance, circumstances permitting, we would be writing to the other committees whose remit covers aspects of the regulations and inviting them to consider and forward their views. Given that this is not presently feasible, are members content to consider only the health aspects of the regulations? Read. Read. Okay. If so, then the committee has two options either to come to a view on the health aspects of the regulations or to decline to come to a view and instead invite the Chair to represent any issues raised at committee when the Assembly debates the, the motion. Uh, would anyone like to put forward a view on that? Sir, I think it's rather academic, given that it was implemented last Sunday, Saturday night, mm. isn't it? So I support the obviously the moves, but they've, they've been implemented, haven't they? So, any objections? From what? Well, well, I, I, I suppose in, in yeah. the event that any members want to have their views on record, it would okay. be important also. Did someone yeah, want to come in? Is that Olivia? I'm here, chair. No, it's Pam. 
doctor, sorry, I don't know who spoke before you, but it, it couldn't be made out at all, so. Yeah, I couldn't hear either. here is academic because the regulations came into effect on Sunday night anyway. Is that just sorry? Just to remind the committee of course that it's subject to the confirmatory procedure, which as Nigel McMahon was explaining means that the regulations will fall unless they are confirmed by a motion in the assembly within twenty eight days of them being laid. Okay, that's the the technical details of it. Um could, could I make a, a suggestion that uh, the committee declines to come to a view and instead invites the chair to represent any views of the committee uh, when the assembly debates the motion? It would mean that the chair could tick tack with members or if any members had any issues that they wanted uh, represented at the motion, uh, at the debate, sure. that they could uh, forward sure. it to him. Yes, Pam? Yeah, could I could, could I make a, a different proposal? Sure. And that would be that the committee should agree to support the health related measures of the SR subject to the review every three weeks. Say the last part again, sorry. Yeah. Could you repeat that, Pam, please? Yeah, that the committee should agree to support the health related measures of the SR subject to the review every three weeks. Just to remind the committee that the, they are subject to review under the regulations every 21 days, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. So the next review is due on the 18th of April. Sure, I, I'm happy to support that we agree to it. I think it's, they're, they're key measures and they're important that the, the community have those measures. It's not a perfect legislation in terms of many aspects, but it's perfect for this moment. And therefore, I think it's, it's important that we support it so that the community see that as Community leaders were 100% behind it. Yeah, I, I would agree with the comments of the vice chair as well. I think it is important that the public realise that there's no dissension among us that uh, as politicians that this is good legislation, it's proper legislation, that's appropriate at this particular time. And we support it. Okay. The, the, there's a proposal then that uh, the committee uh, supports. <coughs> The health aspects of, of this regulation, bearing in mind it's subject to review every 21 days in any event. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? Uh, but I, also, I also think, I also think uh, that, that we could do that um, when it comes in front of the Assembly, if there are issues emerging, we shall flag those up uh, at the Assembly debate, and if, if, if issues are emerging at that stage. Okay. I would agree with that. We're we're happy enough with that proposal then. Okay. Uh, any other issues members wish to raise? Um, so, thank you, members. Can I check formally? Formally, uh, its options are A, B, or C, depending on members' views. No, sorry. Okay. The, sorry. All right. Slight confusion. Uh, let's just keep me right here. The Committee for Health has considered SR 202055, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2020, uh, and is content with the health aspects of the regulations. Yes? yes. That's Agreed. it. Agreed. 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 Um, we're moving on to. A new agenda item, SL1, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Regulations 2020. The next item is a proposal from the Department to make a statutory rule to facilitate dispensing of medicines during the pandemic. The Department advises that the SR would relax rules on possession and supply to allow pharmacists to supply controlled drugs to patients without a prescription in two specified circumstances to ensure continuity of care during the pandemic and alleviate pressures on community pharmacies and GP practices. The SL1 was received yesterday and is in tabled papers at tab 12. It has been considered today as the department wishes, wishes it to have effect from the 6th of April. Uh, uh, I would advise that there's an official here to take any questions. Uh, 
Sorry, may I welcome Canis Ward, Head of Medicine's Regu Regulatory Group from the Department of Health. Uh, you're very welcome, Canis. Do you want to give us a quick briefing on this? And I, could, I, could I ask you to be as concise as possible? And has the department considered any potential unintended consequences of this regulation? said the normal medicines legislation allows prescription only medicines to be to be supplied in a pandemic situation that we're in at the minute uh, by a pharmacist uh, if the pharmacist or the patient doesn't have a prescription this first proposal will allow control <coughs> drugs to be included within this uh, supply arrangement uh, with if a patient doesn't have a prescription the health and social care boy there they have developed a, an emergency supply scheme whereby just what I've described, if a patient was, for whatever reason, unable to get a prescription, a patient could present to their regular pharmacy and be supplied with a, a supply of medicines. Okay. This builds upon that and will allow control drugs to be supplied there. The caveats are the board, um, in conjunction and collaboration with the department, will likely limit the quantities to be supplied, so it might be five days worth, three days worth, okay, or, or whatever see fit, but we don't envisage this being utilised. It'll yeah. only be in extreme circumstances if, for whatever reason, the patient can't get a prescription, that maybe the, the surgery's closed, the GP's unavailable. Fair enough. Uh, Paula, and I, I, I'm just advising just members, question. yeah, we're, we're supposed to be out of here at half one, we've gone past our time already, so Paula, go ahead. Thank you, and good to see you back at committee, Canis. Um, I'm just wondering, whenever the community pharmacy and I presented a couple of weeks ago, they said that, they, that the department was working with the health and social care board and primary care providers on a potential repeat dispensing type service. Is that what this is? It is, in essence, yes. Okay. So without these amendments, it would preclude control drugs, so it, it would mean the patient would have to go to the surgery anyway. So it, okay. You know, it's good. So it's really what the community pharmacists are really calling for at this yes. point. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Canis. Sorry to be. Oh, sorry. Did someone want in on the on remotely? Yeah, Pam. Pam, go ahead. Pam, just to advise you, we're, we're, we should have been out five minutes ago. So if you could be as quickly as possible. I hear that. I appreciate that, and thank you, Canis. And um, I, I really wasn't able to hear very much of what you said there, Canis. But I understand that. These powers will allow the pharmacists greater flexibility to meet patient needs, and we know the pharmacists are the experts in things in, in dealing with drugs. So I would certainly welcome this, um, and 
um, just to ask you, Kenneth, kind of quickly, what, will um, reduce requirements and repeat prescriptions be, how, how will that be communicated to patients? Because that would be very important that, the, that, that people know of these changes so that um, we can act upon them. The, the board is developing guidance and communication at the minute, and if and when these amendments come in, we would build upon that, and I would write out to healthcare professionals in collaboration with the board and uh, to, to essentially GPs and community pharmacists to develop guidance for that. It, it's really a field save. It's not the first um, port of call. The normal procedure would be that they go to their GP. That's a that's what standard should be. It's, this is really, dare I say, a backstop if something untoward happened that a patient couldn't get a prescription, so it shouldn't really be routine. Okay. Thank you, and, and thank you, Canis. Is there, are there are number there are three proposals, if you would like me to go through the three, or...? Um, how long will it take? Five minutes? Two minutes? Uh, go ahead. We'll so, see. We'll see how we go. go the second one is really just again to allow pharmacists to supply a control drug uh, as part of a serious shortage protocol. Again, this is already in place for normal prescription-only medicines. It just builds upon that to allow control drugs to be included upon that. And again, it, the purpose is that a patient doesn't have to go back to a prescriber if their medicine isn't available. You know, it'll give the power to the pharmacist to say, you know, be it I can give you two five milligram tablets instead of a ten, yeah. or I can change your tablets to a capsules, a therapeutic equivalent. Yeah, or if they're not available in the store at the time, the the pharmacist gives a note to say you have to pick up well, that, that's another not, fifty that, ibuprofen tomorrow or something like that. That would be normal practice. Yeah. This is for a serious for short, serious shortage protocol drugs, yeah. where, where, okay. where, where no medicines are available. Uh, the third, again, it's for patients and for uh, GPs and pharmacists is to allow pharmacists to amend an instalment direction on a prescription for a control drug. So an instalment direction is a legal <coughs> direction from a prescriber, normally a GP, to say, uh, to direct the pharmacist to supply the medication in instalments so rather than getting maybe 28 days worth for a number of reasons that the prescriber might want the patient to get a, a week's worth and call in every week. Okay. or maybe twice a week or in extreme circumstances every day. This will allow the pharmacist the autonomy to change that direction initially after consultation with the prescriber uh, to say yeah, the, the pharmacist has the power to amend the prescription to say this patient can maybe pick up every other day or twice a week or whatever it may be. Um, again, if, if a practice was, if a GP surgery was closed and there was no access to the original prescriber, it's, again, it's just trying to alleviate pressure on uh, okay. patients and GPs and pharmacists. Okay. No questions. Thank, thanks for that, Kenneth. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is the committee content that the department make the statutory rule? Yes, sir. Agreed. 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 Okay. Agreed. Turning to correspondence. Uh, May I refer members to correspondence tab 8 of the pack uh, and to the tabled papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 8.1. Are members content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo and to note the items in tabled papers? I comment quickly, Chair, on the correspondence. Go ahead. Um, I can't remember what page it's on, but there, I think it was a, a section that said that I think we're going to get no briefing from the Department of Finance on the budget, if that's correct. So if that's the case, that would be obviously quite concerning because I think there's a lot of stuff that need to be scrutinised in this period of time, stuff that needs to be added in. So I don't know if the committee can request that somebody skates or calls in, but um, it would be an issue that I would be concerned about. So I don't know how do we address it, but I wanted to raise it here. Okay. Just for advice, the committee's oral briefing with the department remains on the forward work programme. We haven't been advised by the department that they wish to move to a written briefing on that. The committee could agree today that it wishes to persist with its request for an oral briefing. I think we should. I yes. suppose we do. Okay. Just a quick one. Uh, uh, yes. Callum. Uh, are, are we still on correspondence, sir? Yes. Yeah, what? just to say, I think we really need to uh, 
discuss their urgency that that modern euro is easy. I think that's pressing. Uh, that 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 is uh, acted upon by the department. So I'm not sure if it's a separate section or if it's coming up now. Um. Just to confirm on the correspondence memo at tab 8.1. The proposal for action there is that we collate that with the other queries that weren't uh, addressed in today's oral briefing and forward to the department. Fair enough. Well, I, I, I think given, given the time is moving on, I think with the if the committee would agree that we, we urgently ask specifically on motor neuron disease that that, that uh, is communicated to the department to act on including them in the vulnerable group. And I would agree with the chair. Uh, we all agreed on that? Yeah. Agreed. 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 Happy enough, Colm? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. I was going to get in about the correspondence regarding sign language and the subtitles at the briefings. I think we probably all got a whole lot of emails. Understandably, people are very concerned that they're not getting the information. And so I wonder if we can then, through the chair, write to the executive office and ask that the subtitles be included in the daily briefings. We've got our sign language interpreters, but there are people who are hard of hearing and would appreciate subtitles. Okay. Item 9, Forward Work, work Programme. Uh, refer members to tab 9.1 of the pack, which has been pared back given the current <coughs> circumstances. Um, our members Prepared to uh, content the note the forward work programme? Note it. Yes? Uh, yes? Can I, just say, can I just say briefly, in light of, in light of the social distancing guideline and in light of the fact that we are in a position to send an example out to the rest of, of the our society out there, that people consider in terms of forward work where possible to come in remotely. Um, we, we need to be very conscious that, that we are asking everyone else to only travel where it's essential. If there are systems in place that allow people to come in remotely, even on a rotating basis or whatever, I think we should, as a committee, be trying to do that to the greatest degree possible. Okay. Can I agree with the chair? Yes. Agreed. Every, everyone agreed on that? Yeah. All agreed. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, any other business? Next, uh, no. Next meeting date, time, place of next meeting is 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, 23rd of April. Room to be confirmed. That's it, Jenna. Thanks. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.